India's market news headquarters. Cutting edge analysis. Influential insights. Market moving intelligence. Broadcasting live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswald Studios in Mumbai. Good morning, you're with us here on a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. It's a Monday morning, a beginning of a fresh new week uh, and uh, it's essentially uh, going to be, uh, it looks like it's going to be a good one. The gift 50 is indicating another 100 point up move. The last I checked, Friday was a blockbuster session with that massive, massive 400 point move on the Nifty. So, you know, really resilient market, top of the pack as far as global markets are concerned. So the backdrop coming into this week is super strong. I'm Prashant. Good be my colleague Sonia and Nigel. Guys, hi, morning. Hi, good morning, Prashant. Good morning, morning. Nigel. And as you say, you know, when you throw the kitchen sink at this market and it'll still sort of overcome yeah. that and rise. I mean, what a week. In fact, on Friday, you had very strong cues from the global markets as well. So it looks like it's going to be a good day. Well, that's right. You know, and the breadth of the market has held really strong. So that's telling you the kind of mood that we are. And you throw the negative news, dips are getting bought into, and the party continues. And uh, I hope, uh, hopefully, the party will pick up in Paris as well, right? Uh, with the Olympic, Olympic Games going yeah. on. Uh, mm -hmm. First sort of medal for India, the bronze one coming in through, uh, coming through for Manu Bhakar. Mm. And, uh, you know, uh, those are uh, visuals which are coming through really uh, iconic images. She, of course, uh, missed her chance because of a pistol malfunction three years back. Uh, but this one, of course, she got, I mean, she could have sort of landed the silver, uh, but she missed it by just a whisker, literally just a whisker. Uh, lots of events lined up. We've got a hundred plus sort of a strong contingent competing at about 16 sports, I think it is. Yeah. Uh, so there is... Uh, I mean, a lot of stake expectations, of course, running very high as well. And today we have uh, India taking on Argentina in the hockey game as well. Yeah. Late on Saturday night, uh, we were down actually against New Zealand. Yeah. But the boys managed to pull it through in the final two minutes or so. So, cheering for our boys, I think that's at around 4pm later today. India taking on Argentina in the hockey match oh, as absolutely. well. Absolutely. Uh, well, so, so let's kick this off with, uh, you know, uh, whether the market will also be uh, cheering along because the backdrop, as I said, is positive. Let's just sort of rewind the clock and take it back to Friday. So we continue to outperform global markets. I am, and I, by the way, you know, we looked at data in the month of July. I mean, this outperformance is stark. Most other markets, I mean, the larger markets, like for example, the US, you look at the Japanese market, and these are not just sort of larger peers, but markets which have done well. Uh, as, you know, if you sort of, as well as India in some cases, most markets are down in the month of July. India is up. You, you extend that timeline to all of 2024 so far. It's India, US and Japan, all about 14 to 15% higher for the year. So really top of the list. And uh, I think the strength here is something to behold. On Friday, FII turned buyers once again. And I think, you know, along with locals who've been buying in strong, that essentially was the reason why you had that 400-point rally on the Nifty. And I think it surprised pretty much everyone. We spoke with so many people. No one really saw it coming especially that day. Uh, IT index and so many other indices, I, I think there were about five sectoral indices with gains of over 2%. U.S. equities on Friday rebounded, so about 1.1% 1, 1 gains on the S&P and the NASDAQ. And mind you, here also, this rotation is underway. Since the uh, 10th of July, which is, I think, uh, uh, around the time that the CPI number, the last CPI numbers came, the uh, NASDAQ has underperformed the Russell 2000 by more than 15%. Uh, essentially, small caps are doing much better as compared to the mega caps. I mean, it's been a highly concentrated market and some of it is moving away. And I think also because earnings have been a little weakish as far as mega cap. Uh, uh, it's a magnificent seven, so as to speak. This week is important for earnings. I'll get to that in just a bit. You had the core PCE numbers, which came through in line with expectations. Markets reacted dovishly. The 10-year was down five basis points. Dollar index was flat, 104.3. The uh, oil prices uh, fell about 2%. I think we're at about 80, 80 and a half or dollars per barrel. This uh, week, we've got the FOMC meeting on Wednesday. We will react to it on Thursday morning. Uh, there is the Bank of Japan, which, a bit, which again, by the way, these are all live meetings where something is expected. And then there, of course, is the Bank of England meeting as well. FOMC, uh, while no change in rates immediately is expected in this meeting on Wednesday, is expected to indicate that conditions are falling into place for cuts. 
because uh, you know at least the last uh, the last three or four data points all indicated they're not hawkish anymore they're not strong data there is weakness uh, you also as i said have lots of earnings about 40 percent of uh, you know snp's market cap will report numbers the ones which really matter for the market are microsoft meta apple amazon these are the mega cap numbers which could you know single-handedly move indices on a day-on-day -day basis so i think uh, becomes important just to circle back to levels here, the Nifty held the 20-day moving average and is now basically back at the previous swing high, which is 24,854. Uh, that was the previous high. We kind of touched that, we crossed that and then closed slightly under it. Uh, I think, I mean, the obvious logical sort of target now is about 25,000. You look at other sort of ways to analyze market, you're looking at about 25,300 levels, extension levels. Uh, on the downside, the 20-day moving average, 24,413, becomes important. I mean, I guess the best way to trade a, a sort of, you know, what is a uh, rallying market, which is sort of m moving up, is to trail with a stop loss. Uh, the, I think the 20-day moving average is as good as any. Nifty Bank retraced after, uh, bounced essentially after touching the 38.2% retrace, uh, retracement of the previous rise. Uh, and uh, on the way up, the 20-day for the Nifty Bank becomes important. That level comes in at about 52,248. Uh, uh, 52, uh, so that's the immediate resistance level. But beyond that, I mean, I think we look at the previous highs, etc. Low of 50,438 will be the important support for the Nifty Bank as well. So th that's essentially a little bit about indices. But really, it's a market of stocks. And I must say, over the weekend, there are many, many companies which have reported numbers. I put out a piece last Friday which showed that there are many more downgrades as compared to upgrades uh, in, uh, out of the 70-odd companies which have reported numbers so far out of NAC 200. But over the weekend, a slew of positive surprises. And I think that should bode well as we uh, sort of gauge the health, earnings health for the market as well. 150 points higher, so it's become stronger from the last time that we checked the gift nifty. Sonia. Absolutely. And, you know, in that slew of earnings, I think ICICI Bank will be the one that everyone's going to focus <coughs> on. Because a very steady set of numbers is what the company reported. The gross NPAs are at a 10-quarter low for ICICI Bank. So definitely that will be something that the street will look forward to. But apart from that as well, very strong global queues coming through this morning. Uh, the Dow was up 650 points on Friday. And across the board, you know, tech stocks did very well. There was a big recovery in our own markets post the budget as well. Uh, the Nifty is back at record highs right now at 24,800. There was large buying by domestic institutions in the last few days. So if you look at the numbers, right, um, the cash deployment from domestic mutual funds has begun now post the budget. DI has bought almost 3,000 crores in the cash markets on Friday. FI has bought about 2,600 crores or so. Um, fresh highs in a lot of names, whether it's Tata Motors, TCS, Infosys, Ashok Leyland. And um, some things to watch out for this week. Uh, you have big earnings from global tech majors, so whether it's Microsoft, Meta, Apple, Amazon, all set to report their numbers. And there's the U.S. Fed Reserve meeting as well on Wednesday. There's no rate cut expected this time around, and the Fed is likely to hold rates steady. Uh, so that's something, you know, that we're watching out for. But in terms of individual stocks, I'm watching for ICICI Bank after a strong set of numbers that the company uh, has reported this time. Well, that's right. And today it should be quite historic because we should be reaching the 25,000 odd mark. But let's tell you what the FIs did, particularly in the FNO market. Well, they added long positions while the clients, they turned net short yet again. So let's pull up uh, those numbers up for you on the screen. The long positioning went up by close to 65,000 contracts. Shots came down by close to around 5,000 uh, contracts odd. Which brings us uh, to the numbers. You know, if you compare Thursday's data with Friday's data, You'll see the FI long positions nearly doubled. You know, more than doubled. It's moved around 1.3 lakh contracts. The clients were net long. They added close to 60,000 short contracts net net. That's why now they're net short at around 53,000 contracts short. Now, moving to the options data, the PCR has moved up. It's moving closer to the upper end of the range. The upper end of the range is around 1.6. We're seeing aggressive put writing. As of now, it is at around 1.36 all. So two strikes I'm pulling up. The 24,600 put, fairly active in Friday's trading session, added 40 lakh shares odd. While on the upside, you had the 24,900 call that added close to around 13 lakh shares odd. But since this put is getting right, uh, written, and it has a premium of close to around 50 uh, rupees odd, if that's telling you the 24,550 level, that becomes the important support zone. If that breaks, you're referring to the 20 DMA. So this uh, zone, you know, of around 24,400 to around 24,550 becomes very, very important. Till this horns, you'll have to say the buy on dips must continue. 
On the upside, resistance comes in at around the 25,050-odd mark. And today, in all probability, we should get to around the 25,000-odd mark. So what happens from here will be important. And what's going to give direction to the Nifty is the Nifty Bank. That's pat in the middle of the 20 as well as the 50 DMA. So which side is it going to drift is going to be important. For the time being, for starters, it starts closer to around, you know, in the direction of the 20 DMA. But can it move to that? You'll get more confident on the Nifty Bank once you get past that 20 DMA odd. The sector that I'm looking at is the cement space, obviously, because yesterday that deal, the long-awaited deal was announced on Ultratech as well as India Cement. The open offer has come through. Now, we'll keep an eye out on Ultratech. For them, it's more or less neutral to positive. India Cements, there's been massive delivery-based buying odd. So the stock opens up closer to around 400 odd. It'll be interesting to see whether it's making a near-term topo there because the street was bracing for this piece of news. On the negative side, Ramco and Dalmia, well, they have big exposure in South India, so they could see a bit of a negative tick. While the smaller cement companies, the street believes that now Orient and Manglam and some of those companies could fold up. Orient Cement is the one in particular that I'll be keeping an eye out for because the street believes there will be some more consolidation on the cards. So we start off in the green. We need to build on from there. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Let's get you some money market views at the start of trade. Uh, before we begin the day, rather, B. Prasanna of ICICI Bank says, ahead of the FOMC, BOE and BOJ decisions, the dollar consolidated after recent corrections owing to a resilient US GDP growth, but weakening inflation data consistent with a soft landing scenario. He says the Japanese yen and Chinese yuan were volatile on account of unwinding of carry trades ahead of the Bank of Japan meeting on Wednesday. He says the FOMC is expected to hold rates but may signal the start of rate cuts from September and the rupee traded in a narrow range with depreciation bias as the RBI continued to accumulate forex reserves against the dollar inflows at higher levels. He expects this trend to continue and expects the rupee to trade in a range of 83.60 to 83.90 this week. All right, on bonds, we've got B. Prasanna who says that global yields continued consolidation amidst data re reiterating soft landing in the U.S. He says a slew of positive news continued in domestic markets. First, he says the FM announced a non-inflationary and fiscally prudent budget. Second, revisions to LCR guidelines are expected to result in additional demand for SLR securities. Overall, he expects the market to trade with a positive bias with a 10-year yield likely to be between 6.9 to 6.95%. Well, we've got a lot of stocks in focus today, so let's run through the list before we get to further analysis. We're looking at Ultratech Cement, India Cement, ICICI Bank, Dr. Reddy's, NTPC, Interglobe Aviation, and BHAL. All of them are reacting on the back of positive news flow. While we have Indison Bank, IDFC First Bank, and Power Grid that will be reacting to negative news flow. Okay, let's do one thing. Let's take a quick commercial break on that note. But on the other side of the break, our list of top 10 stocks is lined up with our entire research team, so don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Bazaar Morning Call. Well, our research team is standing by and lots of individual stocks in focus, so let's get straight to that. First up, we have Ultratech and India Cements on our radar. Nisha is covering that for us. Nisha, over to you. What a busy week it has been, a weekend it has been for uh, the two companies and for all of us. It's a large transaction that has been finally announced. It was in the waiting when the financial investors gave a huge chunk of the stake to Ultratech for buying India Cement. So now they have confirmed that they are going to acquire, Ultratech is going to acquire India Cements with a majority stake coming in. 55% will be the total stake of Ultratech in India Cements after buying out the promotion motors as well as associates and with the previous block that they had bought. The total acquisition cost so far is close to about 5,800 crore rupees and an open offer will be triggered which could take the expense uh, to about uh, 7,000 odd crores but it depends on the tendering. One important bit I would like to point out here is that Jeffries has said that the blended valuation is at $110 per ton which is a tad expensive compared to the other m and Done, but looks like it's going to be positive for Ultra Trek, which is fighting the competition from Adani and consolidating South India position. And India Cements getting a good deal at 390 rupees per share, at which open offer will also be done. All right, thanks a lot for that, Nisha. Well, let's run you through six top points that you need to track with regard to this deal. First, the valuation is roughly around that 108 to 112 dollars per ton, depending on what numbers you are taking. So that's uh, roughly uh, the number. 
Then, in fact, you know, you, you have uh, India Cements, uh, where the total debt is around 2,000 crores approximately. But, uh, you know, the debt can come down substantially because they have some non-core assets. They have more than 25,000 acres, as we know. What does Alditex Cement get? Besides the capacity of 14.5 million tons on, they get limestone reserves. So that seems to be the key reason that they've gone ahead and bid up, uh, you know, the, the stock, uh, you know, for this. And India Cement, well, why did they have to sell? Because the debt was high, utilization levels were low, and a bit up a ton as well was rather low. The stocks you should be tracking, neutral to positive Altertech Cement. For India Cement, we'll see whether it hits a near-term peak. Negative reaction for Amco as well as uh, Dalme Cement, just in the near term, because they are, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, they have been dominating that market. So that uh, there'll be a bit of risk out there. And there could be a positive rub-off on Orient, Mangalam, and Sagar Cement. For the industry on the whole, for the South industry, Near term, there could be pricing pressure. In the longer term, it's a step in the right direction. So we'll keep an eye out on all these stocks. But that's about cement. Let's go across to Sudarshan for ICICI Bank. Morning, Sudarshan. Morning, Nigel. So I'm going with Green for ICICI Bank. It's another quarter of healthy set of earnings from ICICI Bank. Talking first about the headline numbers, NI has come in line at rupees 19,553 crore, and profit has come in 5% higher than estimate. So what are positives in the result? Gross NPA has come in at a 10-quarter low of 2.15%. NIM has slipped 4 bips sequentially and 42 bips year-on-year, -year, but it's in line at 4.36%. And overall stress in the balance sheet is the lowest in 26 quarters or more. more. But there are a few negatives as well. Core operating profit growth is lowest in four quarters. Slippages have risen 15% sequentially and ROE is at 17.7% that is lowest in six quarter, 16 quarters. But overall, it's a healthy set of earnings and much better than the peers that have reported earnings so far. All right. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for that. So that's ICC Bank in focus. Now, Dr. Reddy has also reported numbers. Ekta, how do the numbers look? Morning. Morning. Well, um, numbers look good. Came out on Saturday afternoon, so we'll be reacting to its conference call details as well. So the revenue was up 14%. Street was estimating around a 7% growth. Margins came in at 28%, which was, uh, you know, rather in line with uh, estimates of around 27%. Profit was also around 1,392-odd crores. North America did well. It was up around 20-odd percent year-on-year. Estimates of around $130 million of contribution from Revlim and Generic, which was largely in line. India did well, it was up 15% year on year, but the organic growth was around 7%. And PSAI also did well, which was um, basically their active ingredients business, which was up around 14%. The company says that they target continued growth in the US, US through the year, and they're targeting double digit organic growth in India for the full year as well. And, uh, you know, they have a target of around 25% in terms of margins, which they want to maintain so that the rest goes into capex. So the street, I think, will be happy with the fact that they came above with this quarter. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Well, Sudarshan is going to also talk about Indus and Bank and IDFC First Bank. Sudarshan, over to you. Morning, Sonia. So first, starting with Indus and Bank, the numbers were weak and were much below estimates. NI has missed estimates by more than 2% and profit has missed estimates by more than 5%. Even operational numbers looked weak. Operating profits have declined 3.2% sequentially and it's the biggest decline in 34 quarters. Asset quality gross NPA ratio has risen for the first time in nine quarters. It has come in at 2.02% and margin has come at a seven quarter low of 4.25%. Coming to IDFC First Bank, asset quality remains a concern over here as well. Company reports increase in credit cost as slippages ratio has risen to a seven quarter high and also companies increased its credit cost guidance for FY25. In Q1, slippages have risen 23% sequentially to nearly rupees 1700 crore and net interest margin has dipped both sequentially and year on year. Headline numbers though have come in line. NI has come at 4,695 crore and profit at rupees 681 crore. So I'm going with red for both Indusind Bank and IDFC First Bank. Okay, thanks a lot for that, Sudarshan. Well, let's hop across to Vivek, who's here to tell us about NTPC and Power Grid. Vivek, morning. Well, good morning. NTPC and Power Grid had differing fortunes as far as uh, you know, Q1 was concerned. NTPC, a strong operational performance by the company, results above what the CNBC poll was indicating. Now, when you're talking about uh, the NTPC numbers themselves, uh, revenues higher by 13.5% on a year on year basis. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, this was against a poll of 42,000 crore. The EBITDA higher by almost 9.5%. And this was against a poll of 11,922. That actual numbers came in close to the 12,470 crore mark. Now, talking about the market, 
margins. Margins were a slight miss, 40 basis points, but you know that's something that is free to look ahead. Uh, net profit higher by 11%, uh, profitability coming in at 4,511 crore versus a poll of 4,467 crore. Uh, two key metrics that we are tracking, the thermal PLF, you know, is quite strong over there, 80.39% versus 77.43% on a year-on-year -year basis. Average tariff also increased, coming in at, uh, you know, increased almost 3.5% on a year-on-year -year basis, coming in at 4.53 rupees per unit. Now, talking about power grid, remember the numbers were a bit of a dampener, a slight miss against our poll, but however, you know, it'll be interesting to see what is the prospects that the company give when, you know, they have the analyst meet later today. So, revenues down 1.7% on a year-on-year -year basis, uh, close to the 10,050 crore mark. EBITDA down 3% on a year-on-year -year basis. Margin strong, but despite that, profitability down almost 3.7% on a year-on-year -year basis. Remember, the key numbers to watch out for will be the FI25 CAPEX and the capitalization. CAPEX earlier, they had given a target of over 15,000 crore. That's very strong. And capitalization is likely to double from FI24 levels. Both NTPC and Power Grid have the analyst meet later today, so we'll await granular details from there. Got it. All right. Thanks a lot for that, Vivek. Well, let's also talk about Interglobe Aviation. The numbers came in post-market hours on Friday and uh, they look pretty decent, actually. Revenue growth of 17% is what the company has clocked in. The EBITDA has gone up 4%. Now, margins have been slightly under pressure, uh, falling to 26.4% versus 29.8%. That's also because fuel costs have gone up. Uh, how, the profits are down about 12%, but the good part is yields for the company have improved uh, up 1% year on year, coming in at 5.24 rupees. And if you look at what brokerages have said, right, Jefferies has actually raised the target price on Interglobe Aviation to 4,400 versus 4,150 earlier. And Motilal Oswal has maintained a neutral with a target price of 44.20 on the stock. So I'm going with green on Interglobe Aviation. But BHGL is also in focus this morning. Vamakshi is here to give us details on that. Vamakshi, over to you. Well, good morning. BHGL is expected to trade higher in the, uh, in the session today and that is because the company has received a large order. They've uh, received a, an LOI for worth almost 10,000 crores from the Amudar Valley Corporation and this is for setting up two 800 megawatt uh, Kodarma Phase 2 power station in Jharkhand. Now, Antic believes that FY25 has seen a very strong positive start for the company. They've uh, for, received uh, almost 17,000 crore worth of orders uh, from the power segment and in fact, they're expecting cumulative order inflow to continue, expecting 1.8 lakh crores over FY24 to 26. This along with accelerated execution of their existing order book could lead to better operational performance for the company. They're expecting 156% earning scagger over FY24 to 27. They believe that the stock has meaningfully re-rated over the last one year, but believe that the stock is still inexpensive and has the potential to re-rate further. They maintain a buy target price of 360 per share. Overall, uh, the order win boding well for BHL. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Here's a quick recap of our top stocks. Stocks with positive news flow, Altratech Cement, India Cements, ICICI Bank, Dr. Reddy's, NTPC, Interglobe Aviation and BHEL, while stocks with negative news flow, Indusin Bank, IDFC First Bank and Power Grid. Let's take a short break. On the other side of the break, Prakash Divan will join in to discuss some fundamental stock analysis. Do stay tuned in. Welcome back. Well, as promised, let's get some more fundamental analysis going on uh, a whole host of stocks that we uh, discussed. Prakash Tivan joins us. Hi, Prakash. Uh, good morning and good to see you in. Well, the big deal we were waiting for, it's gone ahead and got announced over the weekend. How would you approach both these two names, Altatech Cement as well as India Cement? Good morning, Nigel. So, uh, you know, I know it's just an interesting. This was kind of anticipated while in the making for a while. Uh, but the, the real benefits are going to be towards uh, the India cement stock price. I mean, Altratech, you know, has already done what it could have done from this uh, uh, advantage that it gets. But you know, since the promoter is also uh, willing to uh, exit from this uh, in this transaction, I don't think there's much of an open offer that residually which will probably impact the price. So you probably see some profit booking closer to where it is today, uh, and which is which is a fairly decent level from uh, the time the first chunk was announced. So. As you rightly said, you know, it's difficult to time these transactions perfectly, but uh, this seems to be probably uh, the, in the intermediate top 
for, uh, from a transaction perspective uh, for India. Okay, well, the other stock that we're looking at this morning is Dr. Reddy's. Good set of numbers coming in. I mean, uh, you know, largely on the top line, right? It's a double-digit growth that DRL has seen. Uh, Prakash, any thoughts on the stock? Do you like it? Uh, would you buy it now? Good, good morning, Sonia. No, so I'll tell you what's interesting about the commentary from the uh, management. They are finally talking about a double-digit uh, organic growth uh, after a fairly long time. Okay, so there have been issues, of course, at the overseas market that they've uh, overcome uh, in the last two quarters. But now, if they're talking about this, and even the other engines have started firing the API part, particularly, which is fairly uh, lucrative in that sense. You'll not only have top-line growth, but you'll probably see some margin uh, expansion and stability uh, at higher levels. So very, very decent. Of course, you know, most of these pharma stocks, especially the bigger ones like Sun, Redis, uh, Cipla, they're, they're quite well priced. So uh, don't expect a very big bump up in that sense, but at least they'll probably be more resilient given the growth outlook uh, from here on. So uh, it's, it's good if people don't have allocation to pharma. This is some time that you could look at adding this and FMCG because when the market shakes off, uh, probably these are sectors which will probably be easier to hide within. So uh, I think Redis definitely stands uh, to be one of the best in that top league, uh, the big pharma uh, that we have. So, but as, as I said, valuations could probably unnerve a few people who look for uh, too much of value investing uh, as a methodology. But otherwise, numbers and the commentary both uh, are, are excellent. I mean, uh, places to hide. I mean, right now, it's all front foot forward, right? Uh, uh, hitting it out of the park, Prakash. We, you know, I'm just going to come back to you, Prakash. Have to take a mandatory break. Uh, so allow us to do that. We'll uh, be back with that and more in just a bit. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Well, the Nifty definitely has its eye on 25,000 and looks like we're going to get to that milestone today. It's a very, very strong opening. It's a confluence of factors. Uh, so, you know, of course, we have positive global cues, good earnings from ICICI Bank and Dr. Reddy's. And Indigo is one stock that I wanted to talk to Prakash Divan about. So let me just get to him. Uh, Prakash, uh, decent set of numbers coming in. In fact, Jefferies has also raised their target price on the stock. Uh, at this point, what would you do with Indigo post the numbers? Well, you know, the numbers are excellent. Uh, continues to give you the confidence that this this uh, company will, you know, be there and right in the top slot. <laughs> but what's what's going to be difficult is it now becomes very vulnerable to any kind of a sustained increase in crude uh, levels. Uh, my my sense is the margins will probably improve in the current quarter that we are in. Uh, you had uh, you know the earlier quarter had a lot of disruptions. Uh, because of which uh, the cost would have gone up. But what's most promising out of uh, the metrics uh, that you look at, Sonia, is, is the number of kilometers available. Now they, what, the, what has happened is they've increased their sector's uh, mix in such a way that all put together, the number of flights that they have, that hasn't increased dramatically, but the sectors that they have kind of consolidated within uh, is very promising. So you'll probably see revenue growth and, of course, uh, you know margins come back. But at 4,400... You know, is the stock pricing in all of that goodness? Most of it, yes. So you would probably buy it on dips if it gets closer to 4,000 uh, on a bad day in terms of you know, some sell-off happening uh, in the broader markets. That's the time to kind of get it because the next move to 5,000 plus territories could probably be slightly slower than what we've seen from 2,000 to 4,400, 4,500. So, you know, it's, it's well poised, but I would, I would not uh, believe that it'll keep on rising in the same way that people have seen it in the last 12 months. All right, Prakash, a question to stay with us. Let's get some more analysis going on the big cement deal. We have Anil Singhvi, uh, you know, someone who's been uh, associated with the cement industry for many, many years. He's here. He's currently the chairman of uh, Sri Digvijay Cement, but he's here to discuss about his company as well as about this big deal. Good morning, Mr. Singhvi. Thanks a lot for joining in. Well, who would have thought, right? All these years, people have been arguing that the asset is not up to mark. You know, it's an aging asset. It'll require a lot of capex as well. And you have Altitech here going ahead and paying top dollar, more than $105 per ton, either which ways you slice it. Your first take on this deal and how, how does it impact the industry? 
I think I would uh, start with saying that advantage, Mr. Srinivasan. Uh, use advantage, Mr. Srinivasan. He understands uh, uh, tennis uh, very well, so I would be using that term. I think if you trace back when the Ultra Tech acquired their uh, grinding unit in Nasik, uh, almost about, I think, six months or one year ago, I think there were indications, at least in my mind, that they were moving in the right direction. And of course, uh, Mr. Radhakrishnan's uh, uh, the money he's uh, holding was, uh, I think, a uh, clear path on that. that they will not stop at 23%. It's not an investment on the balance sheet, but they would acquire the complete asset as well. Now, for the top dollar price, I think Mr. Srinivasan should be thanking all the way to the bank, to Mr. Damani. Had he not entered, had Mr. Damani not entered into uh, India Cement and having 23% position, I'm sure 390 rupees would not have been ever even dreamt by Mr. Srinivasan. I mean, however critical that asset may be for any cement player, but 390 is a very, very high price for the share of India Cement. No doubt about it. So it's a, oh. it's a huge advantage, uh, Mr. Srinivasan, no doubt about it. Uh, Mr. Singhvi, hi. Morning, Prashant here. So, uh, is an indication effect to smaller cement companies where there are potential, I mean, the market always uh, sniffs out potential deals, future deals. Does, is this a re-rating event? Well, I'd mentioned to you when Adani's bought uh, Ambuja and ACC that I think uh, Holcim was a very passive player in the Indian market. So, if you trace it back from 2006 to 2022, for 15, 16 years, not many cement deals happened of, of this nature, which we are seeing in the last two years. I think this whole process will get accelerated because industry is still very fragmented. So, you may see uh, deals happening one after the other, maybe just 2 million, 5 million, 10 million, whatever is there in terms of what is available. And in some cases, what is even not available, like India Cement, was not perceived until about a year mm -hmm. back that it will be available because Srinivasan has been, I mean, he's a, he's a uh, Bishnu Pitama of cement industry, I would call him. I mean, I, that's a very right word for uh, Mr. Srinivasan. He's been there for almost about 60 odd years. So, I think going forward, and particularly I'm very excited because Kesuram and India Cement, these are the two weakest cement plays in South India. And both have been acquired by Ultratag in the last six, eight months' time. So I think industry is taking out the weaker players first. Like, look at Sangi Cement, look at Kesaram, look at India Cement. And that's a very positive side for consolidation industry. So one is not paying $150, $170, but one is paying $90 to $120 to consolidate the industry. Weaker players because they are weak in terms of both, in terms of efficiency plays and pricing. So I think both will benefit the acquirer and the industry. All right, yeah, and Mr. Srinivasan, one of the tough cookies, you know, I've uh, spoken to him over the last 10, 15 years or so, and uh, amazing, uh, you know, in terms of those interactions. Let's uh, get to a couple of details then. CCI, no, no problem for them, you think? There could be some issue in CCI. It's not going to be so simple because having acquired uh, Kesuram recently and again one more asset, there will be some challenge, but I think they'll overcome that. It's not, uh, I don't see this as a... Deal breaker. It may take its own time, nuance, all that, but not a deal breaker. Okay, all right. Uh, before we uh, wrap up, Mr. Singhvi, uh, do you think that South India could be for a bit of uh, pain, you know, in the next 12 to around 18 months because of pricing? Longer term positive, but near term pain. And also, you know, your company, Shri Digvijay Cement, is PE owned. What would you be happy with in terms of an offer, you know, given that this entire re-rating has taken place? So, uh, you know, comment on both those two. Yeah. So, first and foremost, South India, I think what I've seen uh, post Sanghi's acquisition by Adani, I think the similar kind of situation will pan out in uh, South India, where capacity, because both Kesuram and India Cement have not been operating at the full capacities. So, I think there will be a bit of a, a, a tug of war for getting the market share by Kesuram and by India Cement. So, Ultratech will definitely try to push volumes. So, this will uh, uh, put a lot of pressure on the South India, whereas South India prices have already been low. So, I think the next uh, at least two to three quarters, they may still see. And again, the monsoon in uh, Tamil Nadu will be approaching in October, November. So, by the time this deal gets done, there will definitely be a lot of pressure for uh, Ultratech to push uh, India Cement's uh, new production in the market on that. Now, coming back to how industry's profile is going to be, as I mentioned to you, that standalone cement plays, if they're critical for, uh, you know, by Adani or by Ultratech, they will get acquired. Now, you asked about, uh, say I can't comment on that because that's for the decision for the promoters. I know for sure that uh, there will always be a consolidation move going forward in industry for next at least two to three years. Before they start organic uh, growth, I think uh, there will be a lot of plays which will come on uh, stays and uh, let's see who is the best suitor for uh, which bride.
<laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Mr. Singhi, always nice speaking to you. Thank you so much for joining us and, uh, you know, uh, telling us a little bit more about this deal, about the industry. We learn a lot from you every time. But let's connect now with the management of Bandhan Bank. Ratan Kumar Kesh, who is the MD and CEO of Bandhan Bank, joins us to discuss their Q1 performance. Uh, Ratan, thanks a lot for joining in. Uh, you know, just wanted to understand a little more. I mean, I was going through your numbers. Your asset quality issues continue. So this time around as well, you know, the slippages, although they are down, uh, your gross NPA is at, even the, you know, just the ratio itself is at 4.2% versus 3.84. So there is uh, some amount of deterioration in asset quality. Can you tell, give us some guidance on what the gross NPAs and the credit costs could look like for the rest of the year? Thanks, Sonia. Uh, look, 4.2% uh, uh, what you see as gross NPA is largely because of the fact that the advances have sort of steadied uh, this quarter. And generally for us, quarter one is a muted quarter. In fact, over the last years, you would have seen the quarter one, we have shown degrowth sequentially from quarter four to quarter one. This year, we've been able to hold it there. That's one factor. But our slippages are down by almost, uh, um, over the last three, four years, this is the best over slippages, I would say. Uh, it's down to 2.9 from a 3.5%, and the one year back, it was 7%. Uh, as quarter two, middle of quarter two, our advances pick up and then quarter three and four will be significantly better quarter and that trend will continue. Given uh, that, uh, we are not worried about the percentage-wise slippages as a, as a subject. But clearly, um, the overall DPD pool in the EV portfolio, which is one of the larger one for us, has come down. So I think going forward, we get to see significant improvement in the portfolio quality. So can you give me some number? What are you looking at? Gross NPAs, where will it be by the end of the year? I think we will be closer to three and a half uh, or maybe slightly better than that as well. Okay. By, okay, three and a half uh, by the uh, end, end of the uh, year. Mr. <coughs> Ratan, uh, good morning, Prashantia. Good morning. So, uh, is, is, I mean, it's a broad question, but I think you'd understand this. I mean, markets are also waiting. Is, is, is the worst kind of be, starting to look like it's coming, uh, it, it's behind? Uh, how would you address that question? I mean, you know, it looks like a much better quarter in what is otherwise a seasonally weak quarter for you. Uh, you're yeah. also sort of moving towards more secured uh, assets. Uh, so that should also help over a period of time. So just, just uh, help us understand. Uh, how over is, the last, uh, go on. Over yeah. the last five quarters, maybe a couple of years, and definitely over the last five quarters since April 2023, we've been putting a whole bunch of guardrails to improve our portfolio quality. Uh, growth has not been a problem, but I think portfolio quality was significant focus, and we were decisively wanting to come out of the pandemic, post-pandemic uh, challenges. I think I would say, looking at uh, the current set of numbers, this quarter performance, I would say, A, advances, we've been able to hold it, uh, the growth. Subsequently, we will see better quarter in terms of advances, number one. Slippages have come down, and it is coming down consistently over the last five quarters. The DPD pool has dried down from a 2,800 range on the EV to roughly around 1,200 and slightly inched up to 1,400 uh, crores. So uh, I would say we are largely out of the pandemic, maybe... Uh, small residual 5% problem could still be there, which will come over the few quarters, but I think we will be able to overcome that uh, clearly. So that's where it stands today. Uh, in terms of our ability to garner deposits, you have seen our deposit growth has been higher than the uh, than the loan growth. So we will continue to garner better deposit-led liability-led liability uh, asset growth. So our name, we will continue to hold it uh, reasonably well. So I think we are quite optimistic over the next few quarters. Okay, all right. Uh, hi, sir. Good morning and good to see you, Win. And uh, good to hear that you're sounding optimistic about the second half of the year in particular. So for the year, to get a couple of numbers out, loan growth of 20% with margins holding in this vicinity, uh, NIMS at around, uh, you know, the 7.5% or? So loan growth, as we said, that would be in the range of 16 to 18%. Uh, 16 that, will be able to, that will be able to hold it. NIM, depending on how the interest rate looks like, I think we should be able to hold it at 7 to 7.5. This quarter has been great for us. Uh, we are continuing with sequentially 7.6% NIM. But I think it will remain in the range of 7 to 7.5. Okay, all right. You have that credit guarantee fund for micro units money. 
could you quantify what is the amount you are expecting and by when? See, uh, you are aware of the fact that uh, we had got the first tranche settled, second tranche uh, was not settled at that point and then they wanted to conduct an audit. The audit process is uh, advanced extremely well, I think nearing a closer. Unless the audit is fully completed and a discussion deliberations are held internally in their uh, board, etc., I don't think we'll be able to put any specific number, but we are fairly confident of a positive closure soon. Okay. Uh, just, you know, before we let you go, uh, can you give us some qualitative details on the MFI sector itself? I mean, we have noticed some pain in the MFI sector over the last two to three quarters. Uh, do you think it could take some time before things recover there? And what are you looking at? See, there are, first quarter has been a bit of a heat wave, uh, general election. So some of those uh, may have impacted slightly. In some pockets, there has been flood issues. But yes, in some specific geographies like Maharashtra, Punjab, we are seeing stress building up. Although our book size is fairly small in those geographies. Um, overall, I think all the companies in the MFI industry are actually putting some bit of additional guardrails. Uh, to ensure that the, the portfolio quality does not deteriorate. We as a bank, we've been doing all of that for the last five quarters and some of those are holding up extremely well for us. As I said that, we, as we see slightly early signal in this quarter with DPD pool inching slightly upwards, but that essentially in SMA zero pool. Uh, but overall, we are not worried about uh, the industry trend as of now, but yes, we are watchful and careful to make sure that we improve our collection efficiency from here on. Mm. Uh, got that. Um, uh, sir, on the on return on equity, uh, could you uh, guide us? What what would you like this to be at? Came in at about 19% in the first quarter. Uh, what uh, would this, would this, uh, would you be able to maintain this around these levels from here on? Uh, because of the improvement that you're guiding for? So I think depending on how the overall market, the NIM, all of that holds up over the next few quarters, I think we are fairly confident of staying in the range of 16 to 18% and maybe on the positive side uh, as you progress, depending on how our growth and uh, some of the slippages we are able to hold up, hold, hold, hold it at that level. Okay. All right. Uh, we leave it there, Mr. Kumar Kesh. Appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, it's a name where there is interest. There has always been interest. Uh, valuations are, uh, I mean, you can say cheap. Of course, there have been issues uh, at Bandar Bank over the last many, many quarters. So we'll see if uh, the market is willing to bet on the fact that maybe, you know, they're uh, coming out of their uh, issues, Bandar specific issues that they've been facing. We'll take a quick commercial break here. Prakash Devan, of course, is waiting by. So we'll talk more stocks with him on the other side. Stay tuned. Okay, welcome back. Uh, there's 13 minutes to go for the pre-open session. Prakash is with 140 point higher start. Prakash, you know, PNB uh, came out with numbers and uh, numbers look pretty strong. By the way, I don't know if you heard the Bandhan management, uh, but what does the PNB numbers do for the stock and for uh, PSU banks as such? That's one. And second is Mankind. Stock sold off on Friday. A deal was, uh, that uh, BSV deal uh, was announced, of course, Thursday evening. Uh, but there was a call later and the management is saying that the deal will be a creative starting at 528. It's a very large deal uh, for mankind. So just your thoughts on these two. Now, let, me, let me take the mankind question first because uh, I know that was quite a disappointment. Uh, you know, this deal was kind of anticipated to help mankind uh, broaden its uh, portfolio in that sense because uh, it's very, very strong in certain segments, but then the segments are very restricted. Uh, however, you know what the management is probably trying to do is uh, they try to manage expectations by saying this is going to take a much longer time to do it. So, you know, in that process, what's going to happen is your ROC is going to be completely compressed. And whenever that happens, you know, uh, the stock will never be able to, you know, respond very favorably uh, till, till people start seeing some sort of uh, improvement there. So uh, I would watch on a... Uh, if not quarterly basis, but at least half yearly basis, what's happening on the deal in terms of you know the contribution it can make. So, you know, that's that's what. But on the ground, uh, everybody's been talking about it quite favorably, Prashad. I must tell you, I don't know why the management 
sounded so cautious. So that's that's the take there. Uh, on PNB, I think you know the metrics do look good, especially the quality of assets, which has been a issue with PNB in the past. But I think they've departed from that and, and made a fresh uh, you know a move into growth focused uh, commentary as well. Uh, and this time around, the cost of funds, like everybody else, is, has impacted the very, but they did indicate that they're likely to reduce that. So if that were to happen, probably you'll see some improvement uh, continue. But yeah, decent set of numbers. What I would do based on these numbers is go ahead and buy SBI. You know, uh, typically if PNB has been able to do that, which is usually at the you know uh, uh, far end of the cycle, uh, you probably have some of the other banks doing much better. So a Canada Bank or a SBI would probably stand a better chance to get re-rated uh, upwards. You would probably look at something like that. But yes, uh, numbers are good. And the last thing on Mandan, I think it was very positive to see uh, the, the body language, the conviction, the confidence that uh, uh, the new management uh, is reflecting. Uh, there have been issues, of course, we all know. My, uh, you know, so the good news is the numbers are very decent uh, from what they used to be, uh, let's say about a year, two years back for Bandar. So they're getting out of that uh, history. But the not so good news is that this sector, the, especially the small loans and the MFI sector, is something which I feel uh, is not in the best of health. Uh, right. Probably any any trigger from a from a quality perspective could derail things. So I would be a bit cautious. All right, uh, Prakash, we leave it there. Uh, thank you very much for your views. Always useful. Appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18. We'll take a break here. We are back. Amitesh and Sudarshan will be with us with technical trading ideas. Stay tuned. That's coming up. Welcome back. Hope you're having a good morning. Well, before the market opens, let's get in a couple of technical calls coming in there. We have Mitesh as well as Sudarshan who join in. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Mitesh, you go first. Tell us your approach uh, to today's trading session and the levels you're tracking on the Nifty, given that we'd like to start off with a gain of more than 100 points. Morning, Raj. I think the breakout happened uh, on Friday, uh, getting past those levels of 24,850. Uh, this suggests uh, targets of around 25,400, 25,500 uh, uh, zone. I think that, that uh, those levels could be visited in the next few days. So the idea is to be maintained long. Uh, uh, you may not want to, if somebody wants to enter a fresh, you may not want to chase the gap up, but you know, post the gap up, if you get a 30, 40, 50 point kind of an intraday decline, I think that would be a good entry point as well. And very clearly look for uh, stocks which are breaking into fresh highs or breaking out of consolidation. So very clearly trade with a long bias. The worry is the bank nifty, but uh, that still looks slightly positive, though it's not making new highs or it's not even near its uh, previous highs. But that would still, you know, try and uh, head towards 51,800. That's the first target. Or in a good case scenario, 52,200. So the overall buyer should be on the upside. Okay, overall buyer should be on the upside, clearly. Uh, well, Sudarshan Sukhani is also with us. Sudarshan, it's such a remarkable market. I mean, you know, anything and everything is not deterring this market from moving to record highs. And do you think that's something that can continue? And what are the levels to watch today? Yeah, good morning, Sonia. Well, you know, my thoughts mean nothing to the market. I thought we will consolidate and we did a dramatic up move. So the market is giving a different message and I think it's much wiser to follow that message. Lifetime new highs mean go and buy that index or stock. So the Nifty is a buying opportunity again and there is no sense in even calling a top in the Nifty. It's not worth. Buy just as a matter of trading tactics, buy on a minor dip and keep a 150 point stop loss from your entry price. But with that, I would also suggest going long in the bank nifty. Both indices could surprise us. Okay, so let's do one thing. Let's take a break. When we come back, we will talk about individual stocks. So, Mitesh and Sudarshan, just stay on with us. Also, on the other side of the break, we will connect with the Dr. Eddie's management to discuss their Q1 numbers. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We just have, I think, about 15 minutes left for the market to open for the day. We were in conversation with Sudarshan Sukhani and Mitesh Thakkar, so let's get to them. Uh, gentlemen, I wanted individual stock ideas, right? Uh, so, Sudarshan, let me toss it to you. There was a lot of large caps hit fresh highs, especially in the auto space, whether it's Tata Motors, m, &M has been looking pretty good. Uh, you know, ICICI Bank is expected to do well given good numbers. Uh, what are the stocks you're looking at today? Well, it's an all-buy list. 
I mean, I'll start with the names you suggested. I have also M&M in my buy list. So consider buying M&M, which is now willing to break from a significant consolidation with a stop under 2750. Ashok Leyland is a buy with a stop under 232. Apollo Tires is a buy. I, there are so many buy opportunities in this market. Apollo Tires is a buy with a stop under 525. And finally, since we have a short list here, Ramco Cement, uh, there, there seems to be some talk about cement companies in general. So consider buying Ramco Cement with a stop under 790. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> gentlemen, morning. Mitesh, what about you? What are your trades? Morning, Prashant. All buy list for me as well. Um, Ashok Leland made a fresh swing high. So keep a stop at 242. Look for targets of 258. A consolidation breakout from Adani Ports. Uh, that's a buy with a stop at 1510 for targets of around 1615. Balkrishna Industries, the stock has been making uh, newer highs. I think it's just started another movement after a consolidation. So buy here with a stop at 3230 for targets of 3400. And Bharat Forge is a buy with a stop below 1660 for targets of 1740. Yeah. Uh, Mitesh, just uh, a quick word. Uh, okay, I think uh, we'll uh, we'll sort of put those questions to you in just a bit from now. But I think we have the Dr. Reddy's management with us. In fact, we do. So, you know, that's uh, the first uh, stock that we're going to look at right now. For Q1, the company's revenues and margins were better than expectations as the U.S. and the India business drove growth. Eris Israeli, the CEO of Dr. Reddy's Labs, uh, is with us. Mr. Israeli, your U.S. business did better this quarter. Can you tell us what exactly led to that growth and what is the way forward now? Yeah, the U.S. Uh, is uh, is now uh, on a very healthy trajectory. We, we launched three products. We grew the base business. Uh, uh, the generic development continued to contribute according to the contract. So uh, most of it is a uh, growth of the base products that we have in the United States. Okay, all right. But give us a, some more color into it. Uh, what's the guidance uh, in terms of growth for the U.S. business? How much will the key products contribute? We believe that the growth will continue uh, its momentum also in the next coming quarters. Uh, we do have uh, 18 to 20 products uh, for the year, in addition to the uh, increase of market shares and generic revenue. Uh, this more than will offset a uh, future price erosion that may come. So, so far it looks very healthy also in the future. So your India business did well too. What led to that growth? And can you give us a sense of, uh, you know, the way things will shape up in the India business from here? Yeah, it's a, it's a growth in our uh, leading brands. Uh, we are investing a lot in uh, India and uh, it's helped to grow the business uh, uh, after uh, a lot of years of investment. India is a focus market for us, very important for us. Uh, to grow and to become one of the leaders in India. In addition to that, we got uh, the Sanofi vaccines that also helped us uh, as we got the business uh, acquired it from Sanofi, including the Salesforce that come with it. Uh, so both, it's both organic as well as inorganic type of a growth. Okay, all right. Uh, now your margins came in better than expectations. What led to the growth and what's the guidance going forward? We, uh, we feel that 25% is not an outcome, it's more of a choice. Uh, it uh, allows us to give enough uh, as a total shareholder return, and in parallel to that, inv invest in our future. Uh, so uh, the timing of the investment, timing of the revenues is not always in sync. So sometimes we will be below this number, sometime above this number, but overall, uh, it allows us to invest in innovation, invest in uh, consumer care, as well in our biologics, in addition to our generic business. Okay, well, uh, what is the guidance, uh, Mr. Israeli? Will it be 25%? Will it be 28%? And what is the average that we can expect? No, the average that we always maintain is the 25%. Uh, because it's about timing of products, timing of investment, and stuff like that. So we are not uh, sharpening the pencil on the day-to-day -day of the margin. It's more of the amount of uh, money that we can uh, share and put into the future, uh, in either in sales and marketing or in R&D, 
or in CAPEX or in acquisitions. Uh, and uh, so we understand uh, uh, what is the magnitude of the opportunity and accordingly we are adjusting uh, our uh, activities to grow into the future. So the 25%, again, like I mentioned, is an outcome of those calculations. To, so the short question to answer, we, the long-term average will stay around the 25, and the ROC also the same. So 25% without one-off opportunities like RevLimit? Uh, the 25% is unrelated to a product or activity or a country. It's a choice that we want to have in order to know how much we want to invest in the future versus how much we want to give to the total shareholder return. Okay, let's focus on basic numbers. Give us a guidance on revenue margin as well as profitability for the entire fiscal. We will grow double digit in the emerging market. Is that as a whole uh, on the business or how much will it grow? As a whole, like I mentioned, we are always aiming for double digit, at least 25% EBITDA and 25% ROC. This will continue also in the future with fluctuation that may happen from a quarter to quarter. So the recent acquisition of Nicotinel, when does it close and when will it uh, add up in your PNL? So we hope to close the deal uh, sometimes in the... Uh, around the Q4 of this uh, calendar year, which means uh, hopefully October, November, this time frame. And from that point of time, it will start to contribute to our PNL. Okay, what will your M&A strategy be going forward post this acquisition? We have a very healthy uh, financial uh, situation. Uh, we uh, are working in four different spaces, the B2B generics, the branded markets, which is branded generics, as well as innovation in consumer care in biologics. In all of them, we are planning to have a move, uh, primarily uh, licensing products or getting access to the products or buying brands. That's a type of the activity that we do. Uh, we are discussing many deals, we also sign many um, deals, and that's what should, uh, you should expect to see also in the future from us. So in terms of a timeline, when can we expect another possible M&A this year itself? Uh, we are looking for more. Uh, we have financial capacity to do more. When it will happen, uh, whenever a deal can be signed, uh, it's hard to predict. Uh, but, uh, but obviously, once... Uh, we, we are discussing all the time deals, uh, small and big, and let's see what will happen. Okay, what is your status on the GLP-1 drugs? We are there, and, and uh, we are planning to launch them uh, once the patents will allow us to launch them. Tell us more then, sir. What kind of opportunity are you looking at when it comes to GLP-1? It's obviously a very, very big opportunity. Uh, it's, uh, we are planning to launch it. Uh, it's actually multiple products, and uh, naturally, Simaglutide is the biggest of them. But uh, we are in all the peptides, in all the products that consist of the family of GLP 1, and we are planning to launch them in all the markets in the world. So, for us, it's a very big opportunity. So in Eli Lilly, are you in talks for a possible tie-up in India for their GLP-1 drug? We do not have a relationship with the company. But like I mentioned, we are planning to have all the products that uh, are related to GLP-1 in our portfolio. Our products, not somebody else's product. Okay, thanks a lot for joining in. I appreciate your time here on CNBC TV 18. Well, the market is all set to open in five minutes from now and looks like it's going to be a really solid opening. The Nifty is up already about 100 odd points. It's led by the Bank Nifty and, uh, you know, lots of uh, big ups to the ICICI Bank stock because that one looks like it's going to open in the green. Indicin Bank is also up despite not a great set of numbers coming in. NTPC had a very strong set of numbers, so that one is up about 2 or percent. But Sudarshan, what is the big 9-10 call of the day? I consider buying M&M with a stop under 27.50. Okay, and Mitesh, what about you? Um, I'll go with the buy on the ports. Okay, all right. 
Uh, Mitesh, just a, a quick word on two names. Emphasis had a big pop uh, on Friday. Uh, and the management joined us and they sounded very optimistic. And the second is Paytm, which was up 10%. Uh, see, Emphasis, you know, it looks like a very strong candidate to uh, be the latest stock which will clear the earlier highs and get into fresh highs. Uh, uh, if you look back about a year and a half, in January of 22, we saw the stock make multiple highs around 3200 on a weekly basis and not close about. I think that's the first target I'm looking at. But I believe it will eventually cross above that and head towards levels of 4000 plus. So extremely, extremely positive on Emphasis. Paytm, I'm not tracking so difficult for me to comment. Okay, all right. Uh, Paytm on your screen is about three quarters of a percent higher, but uh, you know uh, we'll have market opening coming up in about five minutes or so. Nimesh is standing by with what are the broker uh, standout brokerage reports he's found. Nimesh, morning. Hi, morning, Vishal. Today's standout is an OMC. Is a big upgrade coming in from UBS. So today they've upgraded IOC to buy and they've raised the target price on IOC to 210 versus 150 earlier. They've also upgraded HPCL to buy now with a target price of 445 versus 333 earlier. And on BPCL, well, they've retained a buy, a buy rating, but they've raised the target price there as well to 400 now versus 350. Now, a couple of reasons uh, why they've upgraded OMCs today. One, they believe that the oil market is going to be tight till uh, third quarter of this year, but after that, there's going to be an ease, so that will have, have an impact. OMCs will benefit from a shift from uh, uh, you know, from uh, refining to marketing. And within that, HPCL will be the biggest beneficiary because the ratio is close to 2 is to 2 versus for other OMCs where the ratio is 1 is to 2. Uh, they've, uh, UBS has actually gone ahead and raised the uh, EBIT estimates for all the three OMCs between the 4% to 22%. And they believe that the risk reward is favorable at this valuation and hence a big upgrade on all the three OMCs. But uh, the biggest upgrade is on IOC and on HPCL. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Namesh, when Altitech Cement, they last month had gone ahead and bought 23% uh, approximately from Mr. Damani. And yesterday they went ahead and they bought the promoter stake as well. And now they've launched an open offer for around 390 rupees odd. What are the key six points that we should be tracking? One, valuation-wise, it's under around $110 per ton. That's to entice the current promoter and, in fact, try to pick up the remaining stake. The second point is the debt in the books. It's more than 2,000 crores uh, odd, but it can come down substantially. How is that? They have land. On this channel itself, you know, a few years ago, Mr. Srinivasan had mentioned, they've closed on 25,000 acres of land. They also have some shipping assets as well as interest in coal mines. So put that together, that's what could bring this debt down drastically. What does Altitech Cement get, though? They get closer around 14.5 million tons, predominantly in South India. They'll also move past that uh, 200 million tons uh, capacity. And most important, they get access to limestone reserves, which is the key point in this entire deal. While, uh, Altitech Cement, they'll have their hands full because the India cement asset has been struggling. Debt in the books was mounting at more than 2,000 crores, so some way to reduce that. Utilization levels were in that vicinity of around 60 to 65 percent. And they bit up a ton for the last uh, year was less than 175 rupees per ton. Stocks to tracks, neutral to positive for Altitech as well as uh, India Cement. Let's see what India Cement does from the high of the day. Knee-jerk reaction on the negative side for Ramco as well as Dalmia because now their dominance will be challenged. And positive rub-off on Orient, Manglam as well as on Sagar Cement. For the industry, consolidation is good in the longer term. In the near term, there could be some pricing pressure. All okay. right. Uh, I think uh, that's an interesting uh, quick snapshot view of the deal and implications. SBI card is also going to be in focus, I think, uh, on the negative side. So, Rishan, morning. Morning, Prashant. So, SBI Card has reported earnings for Q1 and earnings were mixed. Headline numbers were in line, but operationally the numbers were weak. Gross NPI has risen 17% and net NPI was up 19%. And credit cost has risen both sequentially and year on year. And revolver rate, one of the main metrics of the company, was flat both sequentially and year on year. And all the brokerages remain negative on the stock. Bernstein has an underperformed call with a target of rupees 600 per share. It says earnings don't justify company's current valuation. Nomura has a reduced call with a target of Rs. 625 per share. It says ROA and ROE have seen a contraction and credit cost and gross NPA have come in at 10 to 11 quarter highs and net card addition is at 10, 12 quarter low. Jefferies has a hold call with it and target has cut to Rs. 735 per share and CLSA has a hold call and target is cut to Rs. 750 per share. Okay. Okay. All right, uh, Sudarshan, thanks very much uh, for that. So those are uh, individual stocks that you need to watch out for. There is so much, right? I mean, uh, in terms of earnings reactions, keep an eye out on IEX as well. Uh, they were, I think there was an investor meeting and uh, there's an upgrade as well from IIFL this morning. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's, of course, I mean, earnings which have been reported, I mean, spillover from Friday. Uh, and we'll see for continuation and some of these names and uh, brokerage calls, OMC is in focus and uh, 
uh, others as well. So just a f couple of seconds to go and we'll have the start coming up on your screens. It's going to be all about uh, individual stocks. Uh, so much to track. 100 points higher is where the, uh, the pre-open left us with. So 120 higher, straight off uh, uh, the cuff. So 24,972 is where the uh, Nifty is starting. Uh, not very <clears throat> sort of uh, far away from that uh, 25,000 uh, levels. Just about 50 odd points away and then you're there. Uh, 122 higher. 377 uh, odd points higher, 380 points higher on the Sensex, uh, and uh, there you've got about 81,726. Uh, advanced decline is pretty solid, 8 is to 1 in favor of advances. Uh, Bank Nifty, uh, which has been the weaker of the uh, indices, it's also up about 3 quarters of a percent. The IT index saw a big 2 percent rally on Friday, it's up uh, 3 quarters of a percent. Uh, but uh, let's uh, take it with specific earnings, reactions and stocks. Sonia. Oh, absolutely. And let's make some noise for this <laughs> market, right? Almost at 25,000. I mean, 40 points away from that 25,000 mark on the Nifty. Who would have thought after the kind of budget that we had, higher taxations that were announced and the disappointment on the street, the market just bounced back in a big way, hitting record highs after record highs and today t turning out to be a terrific day of trade. Now, what is really topping the charts today is the bank Nifty. It's up almost 400 points. Indicent Bank, ICICI Bank are your top gainers. Infosys as well has been hitting new highs, so up about 1% there. TCS is at a fresh high as well, up about um, 1%. So today, both banks and IT are, you know, uh, making their presence felt. Bandhan Bank, by the way, is the big result reaction right now. 6% higher on Bandhan Bank. Topping the charts over there. And the Nifty, by the way, just 40 points away from that, uh, you know, 25,000 mark. Indigo is the one that is, you know, taking it on the chin this morning. Not a great opening to that stock. Of course, it's had a very, very strong rally. And uh, there is a bit of pressure that we're seeing on Indigo's uh, profitability. Uh, so the stock is down about 3 odd percent. But a couple of other names, apart from Bandhan Bank, City Union Bank is doing very well. Inox Wind is up 5.5 percent. PNB is up in the green. Go Digit, PC Jewelers, Yuko Bank, and a couple of other names that are shining uh, through this morning. So just keep an eye out on that. Plenty of stocks hitting fresh 52-week highs as well. Uh, of course, with the market, it's such a high. India Cements, by the way, is at a fresh 52-week high. Ashok Leyland is at a 52-week high. Tata Motors, Apollo Tires, Orient Cement at a fresh 52-week high. Infosys, we spoke about that earlier. Varun Beverages at a fresh 52-week high as well. ICICI Lombard, Tech Mahindra, Colgate, Apple India couple of other names as well. So, very good opening there. Well, that's right. Uh, you know, a few stocks actually that are taking it on the chin. Uh, you have Intellect Design. The revenues came in lower by closure around 5% on a year-on-year -year basis. EBITDA margins as well did come down to around 20% or that compares to around 23%. So, a Intellect Design is taking a bit of a knock. Let's focus on the cement uh, deal though. Alteric Cement for starters, well, positive to neutral is what we said. So, that stock has opened up in the green. Ramco, that's relatively underperforming today. That stock is more or less flatter, sitting with a cut of closure around half a percent, though they as well have laid out some guidance to reduce debt by close to around 1,000 crores by selling non-core uh, non, uh, assets. So Ramco is the underperformer, down closure around half a percent. The other one is India Cements. Now, as I mentioned earlier today, that there's been massive delivery-based buying. And everyone in the last one month or so was expecting this deal to take place. So the high of the day the, is more than 385 rupees. The stock has come off the high point of the day. And now, in fact, the 390 rupee becomes a near-term peak, just in the near term. So because valuation-wise, it's not very, very cheap. India Cements has come off a little bit from the top. The stock to track from year on is going to be Orient Cement. So let's pull up uh, that stock, as well as Manglam Cement. The street believes at some point of time, both those two get folded up as well. So that's why both those two are in focus. Genius Pa came out with a set of numbers overnight and in fact, uh, you know, over the weekend and that stock as well as one of the top volume movers in today's trading session. So explains why that stock is up and about. Go Digit as well up closer on 4.5%, so good move out there. Inox Win is up more than 4%, highlighting these stocks because they're some of the top volume movers. But the banking names, they're calling for special attention. City Union Bank, Bandhan Bank, Punjab and Sindh Bank massive up moves on all those banks, Prashant. Well, absolutely. And, uh, you know, you've got uh, 100 points on the Nifty to uh, show for it. Uh, so 24,941 is where we are at uh, on the index. So 60 points away is the distance between where we are now and the 25,000 mark. Uh, you know, uh, Bandhan uh, is an interesting mover and we were highlighting this in the morning uh, uh, right after the interaction with the management. I mean, you know, the worst behind, that's the question, that's the big question because uh, its valuations are uh, undemanding. Uh, there have been problems and that's the reason why valuations have been undemanding. 
uh, but it's done well in this particular quarter. It's a 9% move on Bandhan. That's really is the stock of the day. Uh, and look at the volumes on it as well. 11 million shares uh, on uh, Bandhan Bank uh, coming through. So uh, that's, a, that's a really big one. And of course, uh, we were discussing PNB with Prakash as well and what PNB numbers could do for the other uh, sort of public sector banks. Uh, PNB is up. Uh, PNB is, by the way, the number one volume led gainer. It's a 5% pop on PNB. Number two is Bandhan. Go Digit, which Nigel highlighted, is up five and a half. Is the number three biggest volume led gainer. Very unusual uh, for Go Digit to show up with such volumes, uh, but uh, that is uh, what you have. Orient Cement is up six uh, percent as well. Uh, so there is a lot of buzz and talk around this one as well. Three fifty five on Orient Cement. Uh, so that's the other sort of cement mover uh, which is uh, coming through. On the downside, Indigo is down three percent. Uh, so four three four six. Uh, you know there is a not a one-off, but there are non-operating. There is a large non-operating income in, in the Indigo numbers, uh, which I think is the reason why you're seeing a bit of a, a cut there. And Paytm, which was the big mover on Friday, is taking a bit of a backseat. is the third largest volume-led loser. It's down three percent uh, right now. So an SBI card, Sudarshan highlighted, one and a half percent lower, at least on the word go. There is Chola Finance down two and a half. Scient is down two percent. Scient numbers on Thursday evening were pretty poor. Stock reacted on Friday, but there is continued selling coming through there. And look at Spandana Spurti, seven percent lower at about six fifty three. So uh, I mean, lots to track here, and we will continue to do that as we uh, go along. Mahesh Padal is with us, Chief Investment Officer at Aditya Birla Sun Life Asset Management Company. Mahesh, good to have you with us here. Good morning. Thanks for your time. Uh, you know. On Friday, sort of, I looked at earnings which had come through till uh, you know the day before until Thursday, and earnings momentum seemed like it was slowing down quite a bit. Uh, now we'll have to do a fresh exercise because so much uh, has happened over the last three days. Uh, but what is your own sense across your research team, etc.? What are they telling you? Uh, how is the earnings season uh, panning out so far? Yeah, uh, good morning, Vishal. So, so you're right. I think uh, uh, this quarter, and even the previous quarter, we have seen uh, the earnings momentum has slowed down. I think what has happened is that, uh, unlike in the past uh, couple of years, two, three years, where we've seen that the uh, bottom line growth was running faster than the top line growth because of margin improvement and some of the efficiency gains which were there, I think that has now kind of, uh, uh, kind of peaked out in a sense. So if you look at the, uh, the top line growth is now tracking closely to your nominal GDP growth, right? And, and with the margin improvement uh, behind us, the bulk of the gains, because of the lower commodity prices, what we had a couple of years back, uh, we see now the earnings growth is now probably tracking closer to the top line growth. And in the top line also, there has been uh, some slow slowdown. Uh, what we have seen in a, in a few sector in, in the consumer space, have you seen the numbers have been uh, slightly lower. So, so all in all, I would say that uh, the uh, clearly, the uh, growth momentum is now on the earnings front is looking at somewhere in the low teens, right, compared to the high teens number what we had seen in, in the last year, and that is pretty much uh, likely to be the trend trend over there. And, and within those numbers, uh, if you look at the largest sector like banking and financials, okay, there are also uh, the growth, uh, the larger gains of last year where we saw the margin nim improvement and, and the big benefit coming in from the credit costs. So that those are kind of a normalizing now, right? So so that is one sector okay, which is uh, uh, clearly seeing a slower growth than what it was was in the last uh, fiscal year. Uh, apart from that, I think uh, uh, IT. If you look at it, IT numbers uh, broadly, I think, are in line with expectations over there. In fact, IT is a sector which uh, looks to have bottomed out, right? The commentary there suggests that uh, you should see uh, improvement uh, in terms of. Uh, growth going forward, though at a, a kind of a moderate pace. And then uh, uh, sectors like, for example, uh, con consumer staples, again, uh, expected to be a, a weak quarter, okay, in terms of the top line growth, uh, and that's what uh, it is reflecting. Sectors like pharma and this thing are uh, showing good numbers, okay, so that's uh, where we've seen uh, some upgrades. Uh, the power sector, again, uh, a, a good, good set of numbers over there. So I would say, on balance, it's been a Kind of a mixed numbers, but clearly the growth of momentum is doing that, which is unexpected lines. Hmm. Mahesh, hi, good morning and thanks for joining in. Uh, you know, I want to ask you a little bit about one of the big story this week, which is the Ola Electric IPO that opens on Friday. Now, this is the first uh, and one of the largest electric two-wheeler manufacturer in India that will be now listing on the exchanges. 
Uh, but you know, this is a space that is, um, I mean, it's growing, but still companies like Ola are sitting on steep losses. So I wanted your thoughts on this electric two-wheeler space because we have listed players like TVS Motor and Bajaj Auto, which have done very well. Uh, are you optimistic here or would you start to get a bit cautious? Yeah, so I think uh, in any sector where there is a disruption which is there and the competitive landscape uh, is kind of getting uh, relayed over there in that sense and that's what's happening in the uh, electric uh, two-wheeler space. So in that sec space, at that time, we would uh, want to really evaluate and see, okay, which are the companies okay, which will uh, emerge winners in, in that space based on either the product in terms of cost competitiveness or, or the distribution side. I would say that that jury there is still uh, out over there in that sense. Uh, we're still not sure. I think uh, the competition is also trying to gear up in terms of their new product portfolio. A uh, couple of other players like Honda is still not there in the market. And and, and it's it's going to be fiercely competitive than what it was Okay, in the IC space where there were only uh, three players who were dominating in that sense. So so I think, and also because of uh, the the uh, the the uh, uh, the pricing over there, right? the cost, okay, where uh, you will see the cost curve come down, especially on the battery front, but still, I think uh, the, the costs are on the higher side and uh, the flame subsidy, which is there, which is kind of supporting, but we don't know how long uh, that will continue and what will be the quantum of that. So in this backdrop, I think we are steadily uh, watching the space, not trying to jump and trying to pull out and say that these are the companies who will be the winners over here. Uh, we will still watch in terms of how this competitive landscape develops over here and then try to uh, take a call. And and and, and we have to be very clear that uh, in the next, at least not immediately, but in the next two, three years, the profitability for EV players, whether we see that at a reasonable level for us to really uh, be positive on that space. But I think the existing players, I think with their strong balance sheets and cash flow, I think will be in a better position to be able to ride this uh, kind of a, uh, place where uh, the intensity is going to be slightly uh, heightened. Okay, so that is in the auto space. Um, the other space I wanted your thoughts about was banking because we've had a mixed bag of numbers actually, but ICICI Bank has been pretty good. Um, overall, how are you feeling about banks? Would you raise your allocation to the banks after what you've seen in this quarter's earnings? The banks have uh, underperformed. Okay, uh, again, by the numbers have been uh, fairly fine. I think it's more to do also because of the uh, regulatory reasons. We have seen a couple of regulations uh, coming in uh, in the last uh, six months, uh, which have kind of uh, hurt in terms of the banks' uh, a ability to grow. I think, and and also to some extent uh, on the margin, the recent uh, the LCR uh, uh, regulations, okay, which uh, stipulates uh, slightly tighter norms over there. Uh, which will also have some impact on the net interest margin. So I think overall in this space, clearly we are seeing a the one challenge was about the deposit growth. Uh, I think which uh, continues to be there. We've seen some of the banks increase the uh, deposit uh, prices recently, but uh, I think concurrent to that, I think you will see the credit growth also probably lower than what we were expecting earlier uh, in this uh, fiscal year. So I think that's probably weighing down on the banks. But uh, I think uh, a lot of the negatives are pricing. I think I think. The regulatory overreach, what we have seen uh, in the last uh, uh, few months, I think I think that should be now behind us. So, so I think uh, from from your from a valuation perspective, and also uh, in terms of a kind of a moderate growth, I think banks uh, after the recent underperformance, I think looks fairly uh, okay to us. I mean, uh, we're not overly positive, but again, not too negative. I think kind of a neutral weight for us on on the banking sector. Mm, okay. All right, uh, Mahesh, we will let you go on that note. Thanks a lot for joining in and speaking to CNBC TV 18. Uh, but just before we let you go, Mahesh, a quick word on the uh, on the market as well, right? Just before we let you go, do you think that given we have a lot of big events that are out of the way, can we build on to these gains that we're seeing in the market? So the markets have actually digested a lot of negative news, right? In the last few months, the election results, the, uh, the budget also in a way was a slight disappointment in terms of the tax okay, which was there. And despite that, you see the markets kind of kind of bounce back, and also uh, the earnings growth, as I said, momentum slowing down. So I think we are getting into a phase where a uh, lot of I, I think from a technical perspective, I would say that we are getting into a phase where the market is kind of getting into the phase where kind of a melt off phase where uh, it's, it's more driven by liquidity and sentiment, which can take it probably still higher from here. But from a fundamental perspective, I would say that uh, markets are 
kind of now entering in a zone where uh, one needs to be a, a bit cautious. Nothing negative from a medium long term perspective. I think underlying fundamentals are good, but uh, one should be fairly cautious. And while the Nifty itself uh, might do better, but uh, the broader breadth of the market is where I would be slightly worried and uh, would want to pair down risk over there. And that would be a prudent thing to do in this kind of a market. But I think stay invested for long term investors. I think nothing to worry about. I think long term outlook uh, remains stable. And the budget also gives macro stability in that sense. So, um, so I think, uh, yeah, it, it can technically, I think, with the kind of it might still move up, but uh, one would uh, want to take some gains in stocks which have rallied too much and gone ahead of fundamentals at this point in time. Okay, all right, Mayesh, appreciate you joining in. Thanks a lot for giving us a view on the markets. We look forward to chatting up with you soon and wishing you a good day ahead. Well, let's focus on one of the stocks of Friday, Sridham Finance. The stock street was impressed with the numbers uh, that they delivered in the first quarter. To understand what went on in the past quarter, what's the way ahead? We have Mr. Umesh Rivankar, the Executive Vice Chairman of Sridham Finance, who joins us on the show. Hi, Mr. Rivankar, good morning and uh, congratulations on a good set in the past quarter. But the street believes you're being very cautious with this mid-teen, 15% AUM growth guidance that you're giving. First quarter itself, you did much better than that, and most are penciling in a number of around 18 19%. Do you think that is uh, in all probably gettable? And also the other positive is now the street believes that there's a lot of cross-selling opportunities. So your non-auto segment will grow as well. How do you see that shaping up? Yeah, good morning. Uh, yes, we were a little uh, cautious uh, because of uh, election, uh, two months of uh, election and uh, uh, normally during the election, the government machineries uh, don't function fully. And many of the business activities, uh, especially road transport and infrastructure, to some extent dependent on the uh, uh, government uh, departments functioning. Therefore, we were a little cautious. But luckily for us, I should say, the entire election process was very smooth and it did not disturb. And it was also well spread. It never concentrated on any particular state for a very long time. That helped uh, the uh, the entire economic activities uh, to con uh, carry on without any kind of a, a disturbance. So the growth was normal for us in the sense, continuing with the last year's 20% AUM growth, we were able to grow and the credit demand was quite good from the urban and the rural. At the same time, the, as you rightly said it, uh, the other benefits which is accruing out of the merger, that is uh, happening. Especially MSME, we are able to grow uh, much faster. And we are able to add more branches for uh, SME, uh, MSME lending activity. Uh, we have been very uh, calibrated. We have been growing steadily. Uh, on uh, MSME because each of these uh, geographies we need to understand, study, and grow the business. That's how we. Ha that's what we have been doing. Mm. Mr. Devankar, but uh, good morning, uh, Prashant here. So uh, Q1 was expected to be a little weaker. It's turned out to be stronger. I think you said in the call Q2 will be Q2 and H2 will be strong, stronger than Q1. So would you want to take up your? Uh, I mean, this, you know, the street is already penciling in 20%. Uh, why not take it to 20%, sir? See, Q2 will be all, uh, sorry, H2 will be always better than uh, H1. The Q2 will be a little unpredictable because of the monsoon impact. Even though excessive monsoon is there across the south, that is very good. And we are also witnessing same in uh, coastal Maharashtra. These are all very good signs. But sometimes it can have some disruption, temporary disruption. Uh, the clear picture uh, will emerge only towards the uh, beginning of uh, September for the uh, the Q2. But the H2, when the monsoon is good, the H2 will be very, very comfortable. So I think uh, the H2, we are very uh, confident. On Q2, we'll be a little uh, cautious, but still, as the opening, as you uh, know, once the opening um, uh, months are good, automatically things will roll out better in the subsequent month. We should be able to grow well for the rest of the uh, financial year. So, uh, sir, can you give us a target? Your AUM growth is at 21%. Uh, 
Uh, what kind of growth are you looking at as we move into the end of FY25? Any targets that you have? See, normally, we don't put target on AUM growth. So what we do is we uh, have a certain uh, uh, growth target depending upon which geography to grow and which are the uh, uh, product or segment to focus on. So we make it uh, quarterly and product mix is very important because certain product mix which we would like uh, we'd like to grow faster there we would like to focus more especially uh, on the uh, sq2 or this part the rest of the financial year we would like to grow the uh, gold loan portfolio because we feel that there's a good opportunity for us to grow that business we'll be uh, pushing for msme growth further in new geographies these are the targets and uh, the aum what uh, comes out is a overall, uh, no, the growth numbers. So uh, the idea is to improve or focus on bottom line. Uh, bottom line is more important and asset qualities are more important. These are the two we have a targets to uh, focus on. And on asset quality, we have improved six basis point Q on Q from 5.45 to uh, 5.39. We would like to inch towards uh, 5% by the end of the uh, financial year. And as far as the credit cost is concerned, uh, it is uh, 1.89 compared to uh, uh, 1.97 uh, uh, last full financial year. So we would like to focus on these parameters rather than the overall growth. Growth will come depending upon the economic activity. So gross NPS, you said, will come down to around 5%, right? That's the goal. Yes, yes. And you're maintaining your AUM growth of close to around 15%, and you believe that NIMS will hover around these levels. Is that correct? No, see, as you have seen uh, faster growth in the first uh, quarter, yes. the AUM growth will be a little f more than 15. Definitely, it will be uh, a little higher. Uh, but mm. see, we, that's not a target for us. So I would like to say, the focus will be more on asset quality and the credit cost. Okay, and credit and of course, cost should... net interest margin. Lovely. So net interest margins, uh, Mr. Ravankar, what should it hold at? Uh, if you could give us a number, because of that product mix that you're talking about, the yields came down a little bit in the first quarter. So how do you see this pan out going ahead? The guidance on the NIMS and credit cost. Uh, you know, for the next couple of years, it should hover around this two percent mark. Yeah, see, uh, basically, uh, as far as the the net interest margin, if you compare Q on Q, there is a big improvement from 8.33 to 8.79. Uh, in the first quarter, especially what happens is the March month, normally we have higher focus or higher demand for new vehicle. And uh, since the, the new vehicle lending is high in the March, February, March of the previous financial year, that gets impacted on the numbers of uh, the Q1. And also, to some extent, the gold and the personal loan, uh, the, there was uh, some moderation in the growth because we are reworking on the strategy in the gold and uh, personal loan because of th some moderation was there. And because of that, the net interest margin was little lesser than the Q4. But if you compare with the Q1 last year, uh, because this March uh, new vehicle lending is year-on-year -year phenomena, then there is a substantial improvement from 8.33 mm. to 8.79. So I feel the net interest margin will hover around uh, this number, 8.8 mm. 8 to uh, around uh, 8.9. That range it will hover around. And as far okay. as the credit cost is concerned, yes, uh, uh, we would like to keep it less than two at any point of time. Last year for the full financial year it was 1.97 would like to improve a little more on the same. Okay, all right. Uh, uh, <clears throat> got that. Uh, we, you know, we had a few other questions, uh, but we leave it there for now. Appreciate you joining in uh, with uh, all of that perspective, Mr. Ravankar. So more than 15%, but you're not putting a number to it. That's not the focus. Focus is on NIMS and credit costs, as you said, on the bottom line front. Thank you very much uh, for being with us here 
on the program. Well, let, let's uh, keep it with NBFCs. We have Cholamandalam Investment uh, and Finance joining us. Disbursement growth was 21% uh, on a year-on-year -year basis. AUMs also saw a healthy traction. Asset quality deteriorated uh, in this quarter. Arun Se uh, Selvan is president and CFO at Cholamandalam. Uh, he's with us uh, right now. Mrs. Selvan, great to have you with us here. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, so when you don't... Uh, sort of miss on asset quality for many, many, many quarters. And then you have a quarter where, uh, you know, there is a slight miss uh, that uh, becomes uh, front and center. Could you, uh, could, could you explain what happened, sir? What caused the pain in uh, Q1 with regards to credit costs and NPS? Uh, if you look at it pre-COVID, this is always the trend. In Q1, there will be a little bit of slippages, but then in Q2, it will over at similar levels, and Q3, Q4, it will improve. We were better than Q, uh, the pre-COVID levels when we closed the financial year FI24, and uh, from there, what we are seeing is a little bit of uh, you know slippage. In a few basis points, it has come off, uh, and NCL has also been higher, you know, so that we provided for most of these asset slippages has happened in stage two and a little bit in stage three. We are confident that this will get pushed back by the end of Q3, Q4 this year. Mm. So what would be, uh, what, I mean, would you want to put a number to it? What would, uh, where do you expect to see credit costs by the end of the year? Yeah, Q3, you will see an improvement. Q2, we will certainly strive to make it better. But uh, I would say uh, that, uh, you know, Q2 always tends to be a little bit of a poor quarter because of monsoons as well as uh, inauspicious months, etc., which brings down economic activities a little bit that by reducing the earning potential of our customers. So we, we don't see a lot of rollbacks happening in Q2, but Q3, Q4, we should see them happening, especially in the context of better monsoon predictions so the rural economy is expected to go up uh, with with uh, also the elections uh, results you know favoring a rural spend so these things would augur well for us in the sector and fourth quarter of this year so in terms of disbursement growth what are we looking at uh, it's almost 22 percent disbursement growth that you've seen in this quarter what is the expectation for the full year fy25 we would keep it in the similar range of 22 to 25 percent. Uh, we will love to see. I mean, if you recall, I've said we will be able to tell more clearly once we get over the Q2 because it reflects the monsoon's impact. And still, we are dependent on monsoons. A large part of our book is still vehicle finance, which is rural based. So we will wait for it. Yes, we have been having a good traction. The good advantage is we are having multiple products, and even within the businesses, we have multiple sub products which helps us to scale up, scale down, depending on the growth in the economy of those specific segments. That's, that's where we are able to push the 20 to 20% 20 plus disbursements, and we are confident we will continue doing it and uh, you know, reach the 25% numbers of disbursement, yes. Okay, all right, Mr. Selvan, hi, good morning, and good to see you in as always. Give us your inputs on the rural market. Because, you know, various sound bites are coming in that suggest there is still a lot of stress out there. What is your understanding, your analysis on ground? So we are seeing a reasonably good traction. Yes, it could be better, but uh, it is uh, still, uh, you know, the monsoon will have to, you know, comfortably settle in. And thereby, sometimes excess monsoon also is a pain, so that shouldn't happen. So we should have the right levels of monsoon. MSP prices have been, you know, better. Bettered, and uh, rural housing subsidies has improved. These things augur well for us, especially in the home loan segment where we are focusing on that three to four type of cities and village uh, towns. So these are positives for us, and we look forward to having a better traction in these segments uh, as we move forward in this year. Okay, all right, and give us a couple of more numbers. Then rural is not in a very difficult spot, going by what you are saying. Give us your yeah. sense in terms of NIMS, if you could give us a range on the guidance and also your credit cost, just wonder a number, uh, what should it look like on an average for the year? See, we stick to our original projection for the full year, which will be like the 7.8% you know, on the NIM, and uh, the credit cost would be in the range of around 1.2 to 1.3 or 1.35%, and the rota to be in the range of around, pre-tax rota to be in the range of around 3.5%. We are working towards that. We, will, we are confident of achieving it as we move into the second half of this year. 
Uh, yes, we had a little bit of a higher credit cost in first quarter, but that is always the trend if you go back pre-COVID level. So. Mm. Mr. Selvan, uh, you know, your cost of funds came down about five basis points uh, on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. Uh, you know, not just you, but one has been picking up that the RBI is getting a little worried about uh, banks lending to uh, NBFCs. Uh, you know, recently there was, of course, increase in risk weights on uh, loans to NBFCs, but generally uh, becoming a little more tighter, uh, formally and informally. Could you tell us if what, what, is, what is happening there and what can we expect? Yes, uh, see, we have, we have a large part of our borrowings coming from banks, but what we are doing is we generate a lot of priority sector assets, which has got a good appetite with banks, and the higher risk weightage don't apply when the banks do on lending towards priority sector assets. So we have been spared of that higher risk weightage you know, cost thereby, and there is a, a large, large amount of demand for priority sector assets, which we are capitalizing both by way of getting an on lending sanctions from the bank as well as doing securitization. You have seen over the years the securitization book has increased substantially. Now it constitutes around 18 to 20 percent of our borrowings, and that's where we also focus on. Apart from that, we have also done ECBs uh, at finer rates. We wait and get the better rates on a fully issued basis. So that helps us to keep the cost down. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Selvan, uh, so w what is, uh, could you tell us what is the proportion of bank lending uh, in your uh, overall mix and uh, <clears throat> X of priority sector on lending which you described, how much is that, what is the dependence? See, around 48% is our bank borrowings out of the total borrowings, uh, again of which more than, uh, you know, uh, I would say 66% of that would be priority sector borrowings uh, from the banks. Okay. okay, got that. Uh, so overall for the commercial vehicle sector, what kind of growth are you looking at? Because, you know, when we speak to large OEMs, uh, we get a sense that there is about an 8% growth that the medium and heavy commercial vehicle sector has seen 8 to 10%. Uh, you cater to that segment in a big way. So what kind of growth do you see? And between pockets, right, MHCVs, LCVs, uh, intermediate commercial vehicles, where do you see maximum traction now? See, we expect that in the current year, the growth would be more in the light commercials and the mini lights uh, because uh, we see the growth happening in heavies and uh, the heavies will slow down a bit in the current year is the sort of our internal view. Uh, that That is where you, you are seeing that the manufacturers talk about lower growth because for them, heavies constitute a large part of the business. Fortunately, unfortunately, for us, heavies don't really constitute a large part of our business, primarily because we can't compete with the fleet operators, uh, with the banks who lend to the fleet operators, because the yields are very fine there, especially in a regime where cost of funds is high. So we, our focus has been more on lights, money lights. So that's been our stronghold, and we continue to, uh, you know, uh, is, uh, uh, do a lot of business in this segment. We have also been focusing uh, on the used business, especially in the used segment, which is the sub tenure vehicles, which is where we saw a lot of traction because of the shift from BS4 to BS6, bringing in a lot of cost variance between the pricing of the new BS6 vehicle versus the old BS4 vehicle of a lower vintage. So we, we have been capitalizing this. Of course, we have also been growing on the passenger bike cars as well as uh, in the two-wheelers. Here again, the focus for us has been more in the rural rather than in the urban, especially in the uh, entry-level cars rather than uh, high-end cars. So these have kept our engines growing, uh, uh, you know, running better as compared to some other competition. Okay. All right, Mr. Selvan, we'll leave it there. Uh, good speaking with you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, so a little bit of, uh, you know, a deterioration in asset quality in Q1, but should pick right back up. Q3, I mean, Q2, both Sriram Finance and Chola told us that because of rains, etc., uh, you know, it's a little uh, uncertain, not as sure. But if rains uh, continue to be as good, H2 perhaps would be uh, much better. 
uh, that it normally is the trend. So that's the word coming in from Chola Finance uh, as well. So two of the largest NBFCs with earnings, and you heard both of them. Uh, you heard from both of them here. Well, uh, Bandhan Bank is the stock of the day, and uh, we discussed this in the morning. 11% move now. So uh, more than anything else, it's a function of, you know, improvement in Q1. Uh, combined with, uh, you know, very, very low valuations uh, on uh, this one. So that's a 20 rupee move on Bandhan Bank, 212. Of course, it's been a huge underperformer. Uh, PNB is up 6%. That, that's the other one, uh, which, of course, is uh, the biggest volume led gainer on the NSC. And I do think it is sparking a bit of a, this is something we were talking about in the morning, sparking a bit of a move in the PSU bank space. Pull up the nifty PSU bank index. I think in term, if you go by sectoral indices, you know, PSU banks are the biggest gainers uh, across the board. So, you know, 3% of the Nifty PSU Bank Index uh, coming through uh, right now. Maybe uh, just look at some of the uh, big gainers there. So, I think Yuko Bank, if you can have these uh, names up, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. Uh, Yuko Bank is a big mover. Indian Overseas Bank is up about uh, 5% or so. Uh, but uh, these are not just uh, these, uh, you know, sort of two names, uh, but uh, many others. Uh, which are uh, sort of moving around as well. So uh, lots happening. Market, of course, uh, coming off a little bit on the Nifty. We got to about 30, within 30 points distance uh, of the 25,000 level. But since we've pulled back a little bit and there is about an 80 point distance now. So 24, 24, 920 at this point. We'll take a quick commercial break here. We are back. The management of IDFC First is going to be joining in to talk about their uh, numbers in just a bit. Stay with us. We now uh, continue with financial earnings, but uh, the first of the banks uh, is what we are analyzing. IDFC First Bank is on our radar company. So good growth in business momentum. Excellent growth, actually, both advances and deposits. But asset quality uh, has given some jitters. Uh, slippage ratio has risen to a seven-quarter high. And uh, therefore, it's not the biggest of the gainers today, but uh, it has moved from red to green. Joining us now, Mr. V. Vaidyanathan, Managing Director and CEO of IDFC First Bank. Uh, Mr. Vaidyanathan, uh, good morning and thank you very much for joining us. As always, congratulations for an excellent show in terms of uh, growth of deposits and uh, uh, advances. Uh, let me uh, start with the deposits part itself. Uh, we heard, saw the announcement of you dropping your savings uh, deposit rate. Uh, what has that done to your cost of deposits? How much has it fallen? What is it uh, quarter on quarter? Basically, our deposits are coming very strong, as you could see, like 39% year-on-year growth. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, and we don't need that much deposits anymore uh, because now we're largely paid off uh, all the past borrowings, the legacy borrowings, IDC Limited. Mm -hmm. uh, so that outstanding legacy, you know, legacy uh, uh, borrowings have come down. So now uh, we need lesser deposits. So we brought down mm -hmm. rates of interest. And in any case, we found that interest rates are not that sensitive in the early buckets. So okay. we dropped it, we are very, very happy, brought it down to 3% just now. Yeah, but for below 5 lakh, it is 3%. But below if you can, uh, I mean, I don't know if you have it right away, but your cost of deposits will be very helpful uh, if you yes, can, I, if you have it readily. Yeah. I can tell cost of funds, if that's a good proxy. Our okay. cost of funds right now is uh, running 6.4%. Uh, and 6.45%. Okay. And we uh, and for the residual 10,000 crores which yet to pay back, if you pay them off, it'll come to 6.36, uh, okay. which frankly is the lowest among the, uh, let me say, mid-tier banks, peer group. We're very happy that okay. we're also raising 39%, also lowest in the in that mid-tier okay. peer group. Okay, okay. No, you actually taken away my second question, which was when do the legacy, uh, uh, you know, long-term and infrastructure bonds of IDFC run off? Uh, you're telling me that uh, you... Uh, that advantage will accrue for the better part of FY25? That's right. We have 10,000 crores more to pay, 10,000 okay. crores to pay, 7,000 yeah. will come up this year and 3,000 next okay. year. Okay. Yeah, I can see that uh, long-term bonds, I think, is 4129 and infrastructure bonds uh, balance is uh, 5306. So together you get a 10,000 crore runoff. Okay, now uh, the, the Reserve Bank's uh, new liquidity ratio is on the anvil. 
uh, how much might that uh, push up your cost of deposits? About two, th two to three basis points. That's uh, it. Because, because some people it. are calculating 10, uh, 10 bips, uh, etc. <laughs> For you, it would be that small, is it? That's all it is. And I'll tell you the numbers so that people can okay. reconcile the numbers. Uh, we think that uh, at the new norms, we need about mm -hmm. 10,000 crores of more deposits or more funding uh, okay. to, to keep the LCR around, say, let me say 115%, because at that level okay. of conservative, hopefully that's a good number. And if you take a negative 70, 80 basis points on 10,000 crores, our impact is 70, 80 crores. On a, for a large bank, 70, 80 crores is not that material. It'll just, it'll just okay. go through. Okay. And uh, what will that, uh, will that do anything to your margins? Can you give some guidance on margins? I told you, two, three basis points. That's not materially moving the number. No, not at all material, uh, if it is only two, three basis points. Uh, right. You know, I, I wanted to check this, and if you remember, we had the discussion last uh, time as well. You know, your NIMS even otherwise are fairly high. Uh, uh, what is it's at 6.2 or something, your NIMS? Yeah, on yeah. top of that, you have a cost of deposits of 6.4, you said, or cost of funds. So, what is the average lending? It would be uh, north of 13%, your, your average uh, lo return on loans? Uh, well, Lata, this is your favorite question, by the way. So yes. I must. I mean, it, because it, there are slippages, people worry, and that's why I have to ask. But I want to, I want to correct you on that first opening sentence you made. Just, just I yeah. need to correct you when you said slippage. Sure. You know, seven, seven quarter high or whatever. That's not correct, by the way. Please check your research. Mm -hmm. But the numbers are uh, uh, to just share with you that our credit cost, because end of the day it's credit cost, end of the day it's provisions. How much are you having to provide? Mm -hmm. Now, our number we have guided is one point six five percent, and because of the joint liability group issue, which we'll come to if, if, you, if you're interested, but that is giving us 20 basis points uh, because of Chennai floods. So 1.85% is in best in class uh, in this league of other institutions who are in the same space as ours, best in class. Uh, so I just want to share that with you, that even at a NIM of 6.3%, uh, and we have fees of about 2%, let's call it 6.3 plus 2, that's maybe 8.3. Mm -hmm. And then we have credit cost of only 1.85, it's a very uh, good ink bank coming up. Okay. Uh, no, at the moment, your slippages, I think, rose by about 23%. Uh, do you think this is a one-off? Uh, it will be more controlled no, I, in coming quarters? I told you, no, because uh, we haven't yet come to the discussion, but basically, we, there were floods in Chennai, okay. uh, sorry, Tamil Nadu, and there was, um, there was some, some impact. Uh, but okay. fundamentally, I told you other numbers, gross NPA is 1.9, net NPA is 0.5 or 0.6. Uh, okay. Credit cost was guided, the numbers I told you. So they're all, all good. Okay. So this 1.65 is the credit cost for the current quarter, I mean, or for the quarter gone by. What is the guidance? Guidance is, no, 1.9 uh, is the number for the quarter that has gone by. Okay. We are expecting okay. elevated credit cost in Q1 and Q2 because Q2. of the floods which I talked about. Q1 okay. and Q2. Okay. Even the upcoming quarter, we're expecting elevated credit cost. So let everybody okay. know so that everybody can expect it sure. from us properly. But Q3, we expect to slow down. And Q4, we won't expect to have even lesser provisions. So this is how the layout because of the event of things. Fine, got that. Now, uh, let me come to your ROA. Uh, you, you have targeted higher ROAs, but uh, this quarter, obviously, it's uh, uh, slipped below one. What is your guidance on ROA? Our uh, ROA this quarter slipped because I told you we had a, you mm -hmm. know, last quarter, same time, we had 30 crores of provisions for joint liability business growth. Yes. This year, we had close to 160 crores. So, this is straight 130 crore extra provisions for that, uh, you know, uh, Chennai flood, uh, Tamil Nadu flood mm -hmm. issue. So, you can imagine this, this we've been a hit by that. And it is, this a is uh, you know, part of cycles of managing the microfinance business. But coming back to ROA, uh, so therefore, uh, we, uh, our ROA right now is like, like stable at 1%, marginally above 1%, um, uh, you know, on a stable state basis. We think okay. that in the next two uh, years, by 2027, we should touch about 1.4%. That's the way we have done the modeling in the bank. Okay. Uh, you have provided a very uh, interesting and new uh, welcome disclosure in terms of vintage loan performance analysis. Can you take us through that? You, you, uh, the uh, net uh, takeaway for me was that now the quality of loans is even be better than pre-COVID times. But can you explain? Yes, actually, the, the background is that many analysts sometimes used to tell us that, look, your credit cost is so looking so low. You know, okay. ever since COVID, our credit cost the lowest, you know, in that peer group of similar lines of businesses are quite low. So people tell us, we don't know what 27 is going to look like. We don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do we know what to look like? So we drew up a vintage chart 
in the vintage okay. analysis just for benefit what we do is that we we evaluate a, a particular portfolio we booked say let me pre covid and then and then we vintage the curve the the delinquency of customers booked post covid and then we check for like to like delinquency of 6 months on books if that is x what is it now we are finding at every data point 6 months on books 9 months on books 12 months on books 15 months on books every vintage curve the booking since post covid have uh, like mean materially lower than the past so i believe indian credit system is also maybe uh, got on that much more maybe conscious of credit yeah. i don't know but our numbers are looking good excluding the 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 microfinance business no no that is an observation if you remember the cea in the economic survey also said the you know the twin balance sheets which were an issue now both corporates and uh, uh, banks have far cleaner balance sheets cost to income uh, ratio is there any guidance you can give on that i mean you have elevated levels obviously for legacy reasons but they have yes. been coming down you can guide on that yes uh, it's it's a very important question you asked so i i must explain uh, so you know in the initial stage of the bank we had closed about uh, 78000 crores of uh, legacy bonds to pay and certificate of deposits that's a mm. very big number so we had to raise deposits to pay that mm. and for that we put up closed about 750 new branches 1100 new atms yes. it was expensive to do all that work the now so all that cost and ratio has now come down to 72% it was 95% next 3 years we think it will be a 65% and in this oh. disclosure this time that we have given segment wise 3 year picture of what the cost income ratio will be and how they will add up for example just take one data point for you in the, you know in this mm. time uh, on on uh, you know credit cards business we were 240% uh -huh. 3 years ago then we touched 160% last year 116% this year we expect to go inflection point we want to go below 100% and mm -hmm. by uh, fy27 it will be 75% so by scale it is coming down and so people should expect from us cost income ratio every year from now on including this year should come down in 25 26 27 you should expect it from us and we will deliver okay no i'm there's no taking away from the credit uh, that uh, you and your bank deserve in terms of the number of branches you'll have uh, increased i think from 2018 to now a uh, three fold or four fold increase in branches that no mean achievement five, five, five fold, fold. <laughs> okay five okay. fold and that's, booked all the expenses and still brought down cost income ratio th that's very uh, creditable uh, let me uh, one more guidance i, I apparently i have time uh, what's the uh, the um, uh, expectation in terms of uh, credit growth which verticals are going to fire for you Uh, you know regulator has constantly been uh, signaling growing the sec uh, secured book because uh, you know want to go there for us frankly both are behaving well but we okay. want to heed the reg regulator okay. and uh, and we also think it's a good good in the longer run for our bank so we okay. are building a gold loan business in a material way uh, okay. two years ago year ago it was 250 crores now it's just 1000 crores end of this year okay. we want to be 3000 crores so gold loan is big okay. one Uh, we are growing our, our tractor financing for, P, for PSL purposes. We are growing the commercial vehicle business for PSL purposes. We are building okay. Kisan credit card. So these are the four or five new businesses we launched, okay. and we want to grow all of them. Yeah, so you don't have to depend on our IDF. Very quickly, uh, half a second. Oh, any ch uh, chance that you will tap the market? Uh, the market is in a giving mode now. Uh, no, no, no. We are our capital adequacy is seventeen percent plus now. Uh, if you factor the so latest money we're getting. So no, 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 not not at this point of time. Well, there but, are lots uh, of people who are tapping because it is giving and not because they need. But I take your point. You are comfortable on capital. Thank you very much, Mr. Vedrathan, for sparing time with us, and we'll invite you again for a more relaxed chat. Okay, so that's uh, IDFC. The stock uh, was began in the red. The slippage issue was a bit of a worry, but uh, now in flat terrain. Let's get our technical experts. Mitesh Thakur joins us now. Mitesh. Uh, What's the call on the Nifty itself uh, after the first hour of trading? So, Lata, I think uh, Nifty. You know, I've uh, suggested that uh, once we get past twenty-five thousand, just psychologically important level, I think the extended targets possibly could be in the range of twenty-five, four hundred, five hundred. So, maintain longs. In fact, uh, uh, you know, um, closer to about uh, twenty-four, nine hundred would be a good entry point with a fifty-point kind of a stop loss. And uh, once we get past twenty-five thousand, long positions can be added on. Oh, okay. And on the stock side as well. Yeah. Sorry. No, no. Go ahead. I want to ask you the stocks. <laughs> yeah. On the stock side as well, I think we're trading with long buys. So DLF is breaking out today uh, after a good uh, sideways uh, consolidation for last many weeks. So DLF is a buy. Keep a stop at eight forty-five. Look for targets of nine hundred to begin with. Maybe eventually higher levels can come in. And the other one is uh, Oro Pharma, which is making new highs, showing continuation. So buy here with a stop below thirteen ninety-nine. 
for targets of 1450. Okay. Got that. Thank you very much, uh, Mitesh. We'll touch base with you later in the day for a moment. It's a quick break and then we will shift our focus to commodity markets. Welcome back. Uh, well, markets, uh, of course, in fine terrain. I mean, stock markets, but uh, giving up a bit. We thought we'd be reaching out to 25,000, but giving up a bit. Let's shift focus to commodity markets now. Manisha Gupta is waiting by. Manisha, you successfully crashed gold prices <laughs> last week. What are you going to do this week? <laughs> oh, well, that. Uh, I'm looking at copper right now, Lata, because in textbook uh, you know, conversation numbers, we are now in a bearish territory for this one. And if it doesn't uh, see a rebound from there, then we are looking at further declines onto this. So the copper prices have declined by 20 to 21 percent from its all-time highs that we saw in the month of May. For the month of July alone, the copper prices have declined by 7 percent. And we are currently trading at a four-month lows in sense of prices there. I want to show you on what we've done in sense of numbers. So on LME, the all-time high was 11,100. We've seen 8,900 on the lower side. As of now, inching close to that 9,000 mark in the Asian space there. On CME, that is New York, we saw the prices hit an all-time high intraday at $5.19 a pound. It's trading at four right now. So it has been a considerable decline onto this one. When you look at the inventories, well, they have doubled up in last couple of years on LME. And that's exactly what we've seen happen in Shanghai as well. Actually, if you want to buy copper right now, it's at, available at a discount. So that is the kind of market this is. There is no demand at immediate physical markets there. Also, when you look at the Chinese numbers, well, China itself, in sense of the domestic demand, has been much on the weaker side. We've seen China, US, Europe, PMI numbers come in on the weaker side as well. So if the demand is not getting damaged further, it's not improving as well. So it's very stagnant as we see it right now, and that's impacting the prices there. Also, the record Chinese refined copper exports for the month of June have weighed in on in various uh, international exchanges there. If you look at uh, the, the overall markets, the street still believes that in the next 6 to 12 months, we still could be looking at higher prices going forward. Well, that's what funds also have done. So when you look at bearish prices, the net long positions on LME have seen a 60% decline. So there's winding up of positions as well that has seen decline come in for the prices. Going forward, the picture still looks quite on the bullish side because when you look at the conventional sector, there's a half a percent demand, the half a percent increase in demand growth that is anticipated. But it clearly is about renewables, grids, EVs, charging stations. That is where the major copper demand will come in the years to come. And that is the number that has been put out by the International Copper Study Group. They are anticipating that for the next 6 to 12 months, you could be looking at stronger copper prices. City Bank of America, everybody believes that copper prices could be hitting all-time highs in 2025 as well. So strong demand estimates coming in for the long-term period there. For this week, though, you have important data as well coming in. It is going to be the inflation numbers from Australia, Bank of Japan monetary policy meeting. So immediate directions would come in from this. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, uh, Manisha. Clearly some disinflation uh, for the Indian core sector uh, inflation as well. We take a break on that note. On the other side, we're going to continue with our earnings analysis. We connect with Mr. Atul Kumar Goel, Managing Director, CEO of Punjab National Bank, to discuss their quarter one earnings, which has clearly excited the street. Welcome back. We continue with earnings analysis and we focus now on Punjab National Bank, PNB, which reported a good performance in Q1. Actually, today, at the moment, PNB is the best performing banking stock, as you can see. Up 6%, profit is up 160%. And surprise, surprise, this is the only bank, I think, which has not reported a rise in slippages uh, or uh, in the slippage ratio. Joining us now is Mr. Atul Kumar Goel, the... Uh, man, CEO and uh, uh, Managing Director of uh, PNB. Mr. Goyal, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, well, let me start with uh, the uh, slippage performance itself. Uh, what are you guiding by way of credit cost? Uh, you, will you be able to maintain this impeccable slippage record, falling slippages at a time when others are reporting higher slippages? Uh, very good morning, Madam Lata. As far as... Uh, Assets quality of the bank is concerned. If you see the last 10 quarter, so you can see there is an improvement in each and every quarter. This time also, 1755 is the slippage, which is the least in the last 10 quarters. 
uh, and our guidance is that ki credit, uh, the slippage number will be less than 1%. Last time we have given the guidance ki our gross NP will be 5%. But we have already achieved 4.98% in the first quarter itself. So we are revising our guidance. Now the gross NPA will be less than 4% by the end of the financial year. Regarding the credit cost, credit cost we have given the guidance for the 1% in the last con call, but we are revising to 0.50% because this quarter this credit cost has reduced to 0.33%. We are having only always the 9, 96% PCR, so there will not be any requirement for the aging provision and recovery will be definitely will be double of the slippage. So we will see some time that there will be a reversal of the uh, credit cost also, but very conservative. I am giving the guidance on the 0.50%. Okay, that's uh, amazing and I guess that explains why the stock has gone from strength to strength. Uh, let me come to the other big uh, point which all banks are faced with, uh, the loan to deposit ratio. Uh, you know, the liquidity uh, ratio will have to go up because of the new RBI rules, liquidity coverage ratio. Uh, what is the coverage for you now? And uh, uh, I think it's 125. What will be the uh, extent to which you will have to increase your liquidity cover? Let's say we have calculated, you are very much right, it is 125. By the new amendment which the draft guidance is there, it will be 115%. Okay. So, you cho will you choose to remain at 115 or will you still raise, uh, you're more comfortable with uh, 125? Would you See, be okay with 125? If we will try to increase 115, so we will see the other avenue where we can increase it also. Okay. So you don't expect any impact on your margins because of this? Uh, what is your margin guidance? Margin will not be impacted on account of this. Margin guidance we have given 2.9 to 3 and we are maintaining the same guidance. Although the first quarter, if you see, it, uh, domestic NIM was 3.23 and the global was 3.07. Yeah, that's right. Your uh, uh, domestic NIM is above uh, 3.2. Considering that you have so much strengths in terms of liquidity, liquidity buffers, uh, why are your advances growth so tepid? What kind of, I mean, 13.9 is, okay, better than uh, the banking sector average, but would you be pushing it up? Definitely, the, we are pushing the credit growth also, and uh, we have given the guidance for the 11 to 12 percent. Our first quarter, it was 12 to 12.20 percent. So, focus area for the REM also. There is a good demand from now the rural and the tier 1 and tier 2 and the semi urban cities also. So, we are trying to push also because we are the one of the largest bank of the country and we are providing the corporate finance also. And as of data, Lata also be around 1 trillion. The sanction limit is already available on the different states under disposed by some time in the NBG has clear. So we are pushing it also, but definitely there should be demand also. Oh, of course, there, there is that. Well, just before you came, three companies have announced uh, huge CapEx orders. LNT announced some 5,000 crore of orders. NBCC has announced orders. And of course, BHGL over the weekend announced a 10,000 crore order. So maybe orders will come. Uh, let me come to the uh, project finance new provisioning that Reserve Bank is pushing. Draft rules are out and uh, probably the final rules will come in a, uh, a few months. What, uh, what can be the impact? Uh, you know, you have been enjoying falling provisions. Will your provisions have to go up? Definitely, the draft guidelines will be the first they have given the timeline also. Last time also I have given the number, the, the project financing around 64,000 crore rupees is as on date in our books also, out okay. of which 50% is under implementation. So the definitely whatever the draft guidelines is there, they are giving the time. So because our balance sheet is very strong nowadays, so additional mm -hmm. provision requirement, what we will be having, we will be easily provide. No issue at all. Okay. No, you will provide, but you know, provisions are your... Trump card. Uh, look at your, uh, you know, the different, your operating profit year on year is up 10%, but your net profit is up 160%. The same thing was there last quarter also. You know, your operating profit was up, I think, to about 12%, but your profit went up, net profit went up 250% in the first quarter. That's largely because your year ago provisions were so high. Uh, that runs off, I think, in two quarters. You will have this advantage of high base provisions for what, one or two quarters more? 
Uh, you are very much right because as I told earlier also 96% provision requirement, provision coverage is already there and every quarter this credit cost will further reduce also even in the uh, subsequent quarter uh, the net profit definitely we will increase because the last time we have given the guidance for the ROA around 0.8% and we have given the guidance 1% will, will be the exit of the current financier. Now I, I am of the view that not exit we will be in a position to achieve this 1% before the exit also. Okay, so uh, what is the uh, expectation that uh, because of project finance, what uh, will there be an impact on the net profit growth or on your ROE in the coming, uh, by the time the year is out? And definitely, definitely, not only to my bank, it, the net profit will all be banks. impacted of uh, all the banking industries also. The little bit cost of the funding will also be increased. So last time also, if you see the on account of the increase, the RW and the NBFC also, there was an the impact of the capital adequacy, but uh, some of the, uh, whatever the impact we have passed to the customer also. So yeah. in this case also, we will try to pass some of the cost to the customer okay. also. Okay. Well, the market is in a very good mood. Your stock itself is up 6% at this point in time because of your performance. Will there be any effort to do an OFS uh, by the government or will you be uh, raising equity? The equity, last time we have told 7,500 QIP, we have got the approval of the board as the shareholder. But since the profitability has increased, so we are reducing to 7,000 to 500 to 5,000, we will raise QIP in this current year. In addition to that, around 7,000 approval we are having for the 81 and 3,000 for the tier 2 also. Okay, okay. And uh, so, so no plans to raise capital now? And not immediately, but 5,000 crore rupees okay. the plan for the okay. raising QIP in this current financial year. Okay. Have you heard anything at all about this expected credit loss rules? Uh, now that all the bank balance sheets are in excellent shape, uh, do you think it's coming, FI25 itself? Last time also, madam, I told you we should wait for the final guidelines because developer will give the five years time also. And what is the ECL? ECL is the how the new underwriting is there. I will give one data for the comfort to all of you. Last four years, this is the data of the 48 month. We have sanctioned more than 8 trillion. Then uh, the, this was more than 7.5 trillion. The outstanding around 6 trillion. This new underwriting with the NPA is allowed 2,200 plus, which is coming only 0.30% of the new underwriting. So what is ECL? Okay. ECL is the how you are behaving the new underwriting. Okay. All right. Uh, well, not uh, I guess uh, you're best placed uh, in terms of even taking the load of uh, ECL, considering the way in which your uh, uh, you know bad loans are also coming down. So, Goel, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us and all the very best for the remaining part of the year. Thank you. Well, uh, the market's at this point in time in a really celebratory mode, but uh, most of the gains are coming actually in the nifty bank. And that's largely because of uh, the bond uh, uh, performance. Maybe the 10-year bond should come up for you. There are various reasons why the Indian bond yields are falling, but today's fall to 6.92, which will be a fresh two-year or maybe a 27-month low, uh, we saw 6.9, uh, 6.92 on the 10-year, I think, before the Reserve Bank started cutting rates. So we are once again back to those levels, and that clearly is extremely positive. Uh, uh, you must look at the 7.1. That's the one that uh, is the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, voluminous traded 10-year uh, bond, and that's a 6.92. That means huge mark-to-market gains for the uh, banking sector, and in addition to the good results uh, posted by banks like PNB and ICICI, you have seen uh, the banking stocks doing very well. 1.2% gain on that index. But all eyes are on the Nifty, actually. One was hoping that uh, uh, it would make that stretch towards the 25,000 mark. But at the moment, uh, it's uh, shying away even from 24,900. So that uh, uh, is the only part which perhaps can be called a disappointment, but it's not very big. It, if it's not 25,000 now, it's sometime perhaps later this week. But that's uh, a marquee performance. It's quite clearly been a bank's day. After sulking and underperforming for a better part of uh, the week and perhaps uh, uh, the quarter, uh, the banking sector, the banking uh, index is finally out and performing their good show by ICICI. And PNB, among other banks, of course, uh, Indescend uh, uh, disappointed a bit. But uh, banking sector has seen a leg up primarily because of the mark-to-market gains uh, on account of the yield performance, I think. And today, that's showing up. With that, we wrap up on Bazaar. And maybe it'll be the turn of Chartbusters to see whether we are any closer to 25,000.